but it wasn't working. We were still losing, and I was getting worse. Like, I was – honestly, I was getting worse. Once again, Pittsburgh, I was balling first, first game of the season. How am I putting more in? Somehow we aren't getting better. Like, what's going on here? So, I thought that the, the answer to that was to, to give my all, and, and then the game would give it back. But what I quickly realized after getting traded to Green Bay that following year and spending some time with who I think is one of the smartest quarterbacks to ever play the game, Aaron Rodgers, who is so well-rounded off the field, that that is completely false, that you don't have to give your all to the game. You just got to be you. And by being you, that's what, that's where your greatness shines. The number one you know, tight end in the country. Adam Brenneman, tight end, Cedar Cliff. And then popped up. Touchdown, Adam Brenneman, a 14-yard strike. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. One, two, one, two, one, two. Adam's been nervous for the last five days for this exact moment, <laughs> and now we're finally here. I I've, ne- already. I've never been so nervous for a podcast. Yeah, what's good with well, you? What's a big guess, man? I mean, we got Deshaun. No, hold on. We got former NFL quarterback. The youngest quarterback to ever start an NFL game until the next year. Notre Dame legend, entrepreneur, founder, and CEO of One of None, and my friend, Deshaun Kaiser. Yeah, yeah baby. Hello. We I've been trying to get this podcast done for like yeah. four months maybe, and you've just kind of like, you know, you'll be like, yeah, 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 I'm in. And then it never happens. Adam, and that <laughs> is not how this goes. <laughs> and then you, here have, we go. you have gone to every college town in America <laughs> – for the last like twelve weeks in a row, you're gonna blame me for this podcast. I've been trying to get I, you to Nashville for how I've long been now? Wait, I've been waiting on you. Exactly. Why are you waiting on me? Oh, here what we are. are. We're here good. We are. Here we are. We're good. It's well, good. I, I appreciate you doing this. Most importantly, I appreciate the two chains. I know you, we might have to adjust the lighting over here. It's kind of hurt you guys, my eyes. As can I'm everyone see? That way. Can everyone see the chains? Because these are courtesy of DK. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Chan- if you can rock them the way that chances used to rock you get these back. Scale of one to ten. What do you think? There's a, a thousand percent chance of getting <laughs> me those back as soon as we get off of this freaking set. I love it. I love it. Well, I, I really feel like we have like a million different things to talk about. Yeah. I have a list of like 500 questions, so this may go three hours long. I don't know. From but I, I think we just start in the beginning. Yeah. We just start with Central Catholic DK, and, yeah. and, and we start with your high school football career. Okay. You were a big-time recruit. Yeah. Take me through and tell me about high school Deshaun Kaiser. So, contrary to what you would expect, uh-huh. like I, it wasn't it wasn't just like a shoe in, you know, six four quarterback goes out there and throws a million touchdowns and has so many yards that it's like guaranteed that he's gonna go somewhere big. Yeah, like my my whole high school football experience was all based on potential. It was never like we were just out there dominating in the pass game. The, the the school I went to was about the run game. I mean, the the year before I started starting quarterback there. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't start until my sophomore year. So my freshman year, I played freshman football. Tommy Vault, he was he was, he was on that team with me. Uh, was he any good or no? He was alright. <laughs> he was alright. I mean, he was like he was like he was good for a freshman football player. Yeah. You know, there, there wasn't much more than that, and he knew it, and that's why he left it right there. That's why he, he, he was like exactly. I mean, he, the kid was playing safety, running a, a, a five one forty. Five one <laughs> was that five true? One. Five one easily. Okay. Slow right. feet. Slow feet. Slow <laughs> feet. But. Um, so with that, you know, we that fr- my, that freshman year, I uh, dressed varsity, but we ran the football every play. I mean, the only time we threw the football was on third and extra long. So for my head coach to kind of get out of those old ways and actually get going, it really didn't happen to my senior year. So for me, football was like you play, you know, I was playing varsity basketball as a freshman, mm-hmm. playing baseball at a, at a pretty high level. I did play freshman in JV baseball uh, before playing varsity there, though. But with that, you know, the – the potential was what got everyone excited. It was it was what I could be. It wasn't necessarily yeah. what I was, and a part of that is because I was because I was playing three sports. I never really like gave my all to the game until I got to college. Really, so you know, sophomore year came in. Uh, we were running the ball. I think we averaged throwing the ball like six times a game up until halfway through the year. Yeah, it was bad. You know, I, I, I was just once again just a tall, athletic dude. And then junior year. Um, we had a really good team that year and started throwing the ball a little bit more. We started playing out of the gun a little bit more, throwing, you know, playing some, some more spread offense. And that ended up in a state championship, which was awesome. 
Um, you win that? We did. Yeah. We won that state championship. That was a, that was a great year, 20, 2012. And then um, from there, after that state championship, you know, um, I, I got a couple offers, like some of those like random offers that like weren't really serious offers, but because you're so athletic. Like what? Like, like what schools? Like, like, like Mac uh, schools? Or you mean like I mean, power yeah, five? So I had, I had the Mac schools. You yeah. know, you had BG that's close by. You had Toledo that was close by. Toledo offered me in all three sports as a, as a uh, I think, a sophomore. When so. Toledo offered, you were on cloud nine? You were <laughs> yeah. So here's the, here's the catch. I had I had like Syracuse, oh, you know, God. like yeah. schools that were like trying to get football up and the going. ones that all for everybody. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that, that I had a local guy who was from Toledo, knew who I was, offered me after my freshman season. I hadn't even played varsity yet, but because I'm you know a tall, athletic yeah. guy playing quarterback and throw the ball a long way, I was getting those offers. So, um, all right, so I, I I I picked up more of those in in my junior year, and then after my junior year is when things started to get a little bit serious. Now you have these committable offers. Mm -hmm. You got good schools: Michigan State, Duke, North Carolina, um, Ivy League. So it was it was starting to pick up a little bit for me. And then the way that the, uh, the recruiting kind of story goes is I'm um, getting ready to make a decision. You know, as a junior in high school, that's pretty much your, your senior year when it comes to making your decision. Sure. You know, yeah. There's only so many spots out there. They're only offering – most teams are only offering one quarterback a, a year, and those, 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 uh, those offers typically go out um, – they're only committing one quarterback a year, and those offers typically go out after your sophomore year. So I get to my junior year. i got to make a decision before all these slots get taken up. So I had Michigan State, had North Carolina – um, and some other schools, but that was really the, the, the main decision I was looking to make there. And the day that I was going to commit to Michigan State, a quarterback committed there. I believe his last name was Durkin. He ended up playing, I think, linebacker, like Virginia Tech or something. <laughs> that, that was tough, but that hurt. But they said they would still take me. I can go compete with him, uh -huh. or I can go to North Carolina. So I'm, I'm actually going to make the decision to go to North Carolina. Love the offensive coordinator there. Um, love the quarterback coach. Um, and Larry Fedora, head coach? Yeah, Fedora's head coach. Uh, yeah. um, but I was not not really excited about it. My parents could tell I wasn't really excited. So um, the day I was going to make the call, wake up, dad comes upstairs. I'm kind of stressing. Um, you know, is this the right move? Is there a better school for me? You had like Tennessee. You had, you know, some of these other schools. It's like maybe I should go to a bigger school if I'm going to go play at that level. Um, but ultimately, uh, my dad said, look, what if there was one school out there or a couple schools out there that you would consider like just call them just see just see if there's someone out there that might consider taking yeah. you still and and before you make this final decision and it's like but but i think you should narrow it down to like really one school what, what's that school and where would you go and i was like that notre dame it's like it's right down the road it's a great education it's playing that you know the highest level of football i would love to go to notre dame they're in a national championship that year 2013 i would love to go to notre dame so i gave him a call and uh, the my area coach at the time was Mike Elston, but then the offensive coordinator was Chuck Martin. And I'd get on the phone with both of them. Chuck, great yeah. guy, great guy, Miami, Ohio. Um, and you know, asked them, "Hey, what are you guys doing in this year?" They, at first, they were saying they weren't taking a quarterback, but the week that I called, Everett Golson had decided or had gotten in trouble. He had the the academic issue right. where he was going to get suspended for the next year, so they wanted to bring in another guy just in case. He's like, "We'll come out and watch you throw. Can you hold off on making your commitment?" They came and watched me throw the following Wednesday before school. They offered me after school, after seeing me throw. And then all of a sudden, LSU, Alabama, USC, you know, all these top schools start calling and getting offers from all of them um, and really reopened my, my, my whole recruiting process. Um, about two or three months later, now I've d narrowed it down between Notre Dame, L LSU, and Alabama. Have a, a week's worth of trips that I'm planning. I'm going to go to see Alabama on Tuesday. I'm going to see LSU on Friday, um, and I'm going to go see Notre Dame the Sunday before that trip as well. Um, so I end up taking that trip to Notre Dame on that Sunday. Beautiful spring day, perfect lighting, mm -hmm. perfect weather, and you just feel that that God country in Notre Dame. And then you know quickly realized that there was just no better option. You know, my parents, who, as we were trying to plan that trip to go down south, it was a 1000 bucks for all the flights. It was just so much moving and hassle to, yeah. to be able to make it happen, being able to drive two hours over there. Got done with my visit, called Alabama on the ride home from Notre Dame, called LSU on the ride, on the ride home, committed the next day, ended it. Notre Dame is the uh, probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. What what other schools like wanted you the most? Was it Alabama? Was it UNC? Who who recruited you the hardest? You know, harder than Notre Dame did, or as hard? LSU. Yeah. LSU was like that. That that was like the toughest conversation I ever had. And who was, who was the head coach? It was Les Miles, who's the head yeah. coach. But Cam Cameron, who's a former offensive coordinator in NFL, um, or, or 
Pretty sure former head coach in NFL. I mean, this is as big, big as it gets. Understands how the system goes. Loves me. You know, he had he had a son who was playing baseball there. So, he, you know, had kids my age. And you could just feel that. Came out all the way to Toledo. Went and watched me play a little small school, Fremont, 45 minutes out outside of town in a baseball game. You could tell that he was, like, really into it. And I was really into it. Lo- loved the concept of LSU. But at the end of the day, it was just so tough to make that trip down there. And, quite frankly, I was just more focused in on getting the best degree possible. Yeah. So it ended up being a, 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 an easier decision than, than I probably expected. How, how'd you commit? Like, what was the, did you call Brian Kelly? Was it Chuck Martin? What was the process of actually committing? I called, I called Chuck Martin. I didn't even really have a relationship with Brian Kelly. I, I didn't even talk to Brian Kelly until I got on the visit, you know, <laughs> and, and went in and had a great conversation with him. But then afterwards, I, I, don't, I don't know Brian well enough to go and commit to him. So I called yeah. Chuck, I commit, he, he brings Brian, puts him on the phone and let him know I'm coming. And, uh, you know, quickly went out there, and, and but that that really I think kind of started my um, journey at Notre Dame was that it was never it was never like a all in on the next you know quarterback of Notre Dame in my recruiting process or in my experience there. I was always like the the potential guy. Once again, I didn't have stats. Yeah. I wasn't like the big five star recruit that everyone was excited to land. It was like no a safe bet. You know, yeah. good GPA, well spoken. You know, going to go to the business school like. You know, he's he's going to be a good guy on, on the roster. We'll figure it out when we figure it out. Malik Zaire, though, that's a guy. You know, he, he was a class above me. That yeah. was that was a big-time recruit. They knew that he was going to be a, a big-time player for us. And then, uh, you know, a couple years later there, it wasn't until Malik got hurt and before I was able to actually get my opportunity to go out and show what I could do. Yeah, let, let's talk about that process because you, you get there, you don't play your first year, right? Yeah. And then year number two is Golson – and Zaire, right? And then it's not until Zaire gets hurt, right, that you so, actually play? Yeah, so, so my, my my freshman year, I redshirt. Yeah. Everett Golson is a starter. Mm-hmm. Malik Zaire is the backup. Everett, um, at, uh, to, to add even more details to it, I, I don't think I'm going to play at all. I sucked my freshman yeah. year. Oh, I was terrible. My, my <laughs> You were like, I'm, I'm bad at football. <laughs> oh, I was terrible. Like, my, my future head coach of uh, at the Green Bay Packers, Matt LaFleur, was my QB coach my freshman year. Oh, wow. Okay. And, even, and even suggested that maybe it was best for me to play tight end. Like, that's, that's how bad I was. I was terrible. Just, just not very good. And you, you kind of were, you were like, maybe I should play tight end. Yeah, you I were was, thinking I, about it? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I mean, I was just going to do whatever it took. Actually, no, I didn't like the idea of playing tight end. I liked the idea of, like, no, I'm just going to be the best signaler in college football. <laughs> I'm going to hold the best field goal, the best extra point. I'm going to be able to wear the Notre Dame jersey. Right. But more importantly, I'm going to get this Notre Dame degree. Yeah, you're in the business school at Notre Dame, I'm right? at the business yeah. school at Notre Dame. That, yeah. that's, that's the biggest, you know, the, that's the reason that I'm there. So I was completely okay with it. But I actually started throwing bullpens. I was actually going to try to play baseball there. And um, Torrey Hunter Jr. Really? was was making the move over to baseball, and he was hitting BP. I would go hit a little bit of BP. I was throwing a couple bullpens, and I was uh, my finals week was the was the week that uh, I was going to go have a conversation with the head coach. Torrey had put me in touch of the baseball team, and as I walked out of my last final, I looked down on my phone. My phone had been buzzing like crazy. I looked down on my phone. Ever Golson's transferring to Florida State. So now all of a sudden, there's only two quarterbacks on the roster. Yeah. It's like, all right, I got to at least, you know, see screw what the baseball. Do. So I got to yeah. go see what I can do yeah. here. So I locked in, and I had a really good offseason, and I, I got a lot better that offseason and really complete, competed with Malik, that, that, that training camp. Now he ended up edging me out, became a captain, and then, um, you know, he goes out against Texas in, on the first week of, the, of, my, of my sophomore year, redshirt freshman year, and throws for, I think, it's either four or five touchdowns. He's a Heisman hopeful. Yeah. Will Fuller scores a bunch of touchdowns. We score a bunch of points. I go out there and, and get into some terrible plays <laughs> and <laughs> ended up getting sacked, just ugly, just just uh, ugly experience. So it was like, all right, you know, you win, Malik. You got it, you know. And I kind of, like, relaxed a little bit. Like, at first I was a little angry. I, I thought that I was competing pretty well. I thought I had a chance to be a starter. Malik edges me out but then has his great game. It's like, you know what, that, that's exactly what we expected. So that, that next week – I actually relax, kind of calm down a little bit. You know, I'm hanging out. You know, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of pressure off myself, focusing back in on school, kicking in with some guys in my dorm a little bit more, just kind of kind of chilling, thinking like, all right, I'm going to be the backup. This is going to be another great role for me. And we get out there, and Malik goes down and breaks his ankle. Holy crap. Yeah. There's, there's only one more guy on the <laughs> roster, and it's, <laughs> it's me. You. Like, I got to go. So uh, Brian Kelly's freaking out. Once again, I don't really have – some crazy tight relationship with Brian. So it's just like, you know, he's freaking out. We never really even practiced me really being the guy that year. So it's like, all right, what are we going to do any di- or what are we going to do differently? 
um, ended up throwing me out there. And the best thing that happened to me that game was the first play that I went out on the field. I hand the ball off to C.J. Procise, and he scores a touchdown. Mm -hmm. So most quarterbacks, you get thrown out there after an injury. You go into, you know, third down, or you, you might get a quick third first long. down, yeah. third and long. Yeah. Now you got to, you know, you throw a ball yeah. in the dirt. People are questioning whether you're the guy. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just yeah. tough, you know. But for me to be able to go out there, hand the ball off, we score a touchdown, go to the sideline, all right. Let's like everyone's let's calm down. Yeah, calm yeah. down. Let's yeah. talk about you know yeah. you know. Let me make sure I know the plays that that are supposed to be called going in the second half there. But ultimately, um, didn't play well in the third quarter. You know, we had a really good offensive line, so we were able to run the ball quite well. But we ended up giving up our lead. Virginia takes the lead going into the fourth quarter, and all of a sudden we end up in this two minute drill at the end of the at the end of the game. Um, I think we went we went to fourth down and the first on the first uh, possession or the first drive. Um, and throw a couple bad passes, end up making a pretty cool play, you know, kind of uh, uh, escape the pocket and make a good play, throwing the back, ball back across to the middle of the field to CJ Pro size. Um, but but uh, get to a, a third and long situation. It's like 30 some seconds left. We call a sluggo to Will Fuller. And the cornerback doesn't realize that we call Hut. So he's looking in at the ball. All of a sudden, Will Fuller, the fastest guy in the country, is running a sluggo right past yeah. him. I notice it, throw the ball as far as I can, and Will Fuller catches in a touchdown, and everything changes. What was your first thought when Malik went down with that injury? Were you like, were you like, oh shit, or were you like, I'm ready to go? I was ready. Like yeah. I, I was ready. Yeah. I actually, actually earlier that game, I was hyped because early that game, that was my my first ever touchdown as a Notre Dame quarterback was a fake field goal at the beginning of the game. So I was actually oh, pretty God. hype. I was on my high horse. I was feeling myself. I just got done getting myself a little shovel pass. Durham Smythe. Oh, you were touchdown. the holder? I was a holder. <laughs> got it. Yep, yep. Yep. Take the ball <laughs> over my head. Duck it underneath. There so it is. So confidence touchdown. was high. Confidence, confidence was high. high. I'm feeling myself. I'm <laughs> yeah. definitely – we're going to go win this game against Virginia. Malik's going to go ball out. I'm uh, going to go party and pretend like, you know, yeah, I'm on the stat books, you know. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I, I actually – it wasn't that bad. I've, I've never been one to get really nervous. Like, I, it's – there's – to me, the the – I play the game because of the the chess match that it is. Yeah. So I get so caught up in, you know, the 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 game plan against us and how we're kind of attacking them and the other twenty one guys in the field that you gotta really understand as a quarterback that I was more caught in that than I was the, the pressure. So I, I never really you know, was one to, you know, get a bunch of butterflies and, and, yeah. and get nervous in those moments. What, what was the game where they had the two-point conversion where Chris Brown, uh, right, didn't cat, called it and didn't, didn't get in the end zone? Was it Clemson in 2015? Yeah, that was tough. What, what, what was happened tough. in that game? Yeah, so we, so we beat Virginia. We, we go home, play the first game of the year against uh, – our first home game of the year against Georgia Tech. Um, I played okay that game, but we win. I play against Miami of Ohio. Now we put up some big points. So I'm feeling myself. And now all of a sudden we're, I think, a top-10 team. Um, Clemson's a top 10 team. This is the first big game of the year. Hurricane Matthew hits. So this is like a crazy hurricane, raining yeah. like crazy. Um, we sit, we're sitting on the bus for like 50 minutes in the middle of nowhere, South Carolina. Um, but that game ended up going back and forth. We get out there, it's raining, raining like crazy. And gosh, I thought that Notre Dame, playing at Notre Dame was cool. I mean, you got a DJ playing in Clemson. Oh, it's so Death man. Valley. It's <laughs> as loud as it gets. My, my face mask is rattling as I'm trying to call the plays. It was, it was nuts up. Um, Deshaun Watson comes out, you know, I, I knew, I'd known Deshaun Watson since high school from the lead 11 days and stuff. And he comes out, you know, swag and he runs a quarterback draw on the first play, you know, running four, four down the sideline, you know, come off, you know, wiping himself <laughs> off. I'm like, Oh damn, this is about to get ugly. Uh, but we ended up having a, a pretty good game. We, I, I ended up throwing the ball pretty well. Never rain, went, rain, rain was never an issue for me. I, I, I played in freaking Northwest Ohio. You know, if you went to, if you went to the state championship, you're playing through rain, yeah, sleet, snow, snow. Yeah negative 10 by the time you get to the, the state championship game. So I, I knew to just adjust the grip on the ball a little bit higher and keep letting it rip. And quite frankly, it took the pressure off because if, if you miss your throw, it's like, yeah, we're in a hurricane. You know? so like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to throw whatever. Yeah. Um, but we end up going back and forth, back and forth, and end up in that situation where we're, I think it's 21 to 23. Tommy Vault, check, check that one out. I think it's 21, 23. Um, two-point conversion. Um, two-point conversion. Uh, and and it, the – the story behind it, I think, is actually kind of – it's an interesting one. You're a coach. You know, yeah. you're, you're a former yeah. coach. So, you typically get into two-point conversion situations, and you have, like, one, maybe two plays yeah. that you're ready to run for two-point conversion. You just don't you – don't, you, you don't really plan yeah. for that, right? You have goal line, which is a little bit different than two-point. Two-point, yeah. you really need it, right? Yeah. So, we go in having our two plays, and for some reason, we ended up getting into, I think, a fourth down, 
and a, a third down in the same two point um, kind of area. So you use the two plays. We already used the two plays. The yeah. first, it was a quarterback power run game. Mm-hmm. I had ran it earlier and scored. Then we went to the second play, yeah. and it was a backside, um, you know, sit with the with the uh, wrap in behind it, and threw that earlier. Um, unfortunately, that you know, once again, rainy game. That one ended up getting dropped. So now we're coming back to the end of the game, and what play are you going to call? Well, we yeah. scored on we scored on the quarterback power. You know, let's go back to the quarterback power. I freaking I, we break the huddle, and I see the whole defense just shift mm-hmm. right over to where we're running this quarterback power to, and I was like, oh, this is going to be tough, and you know, take a snap. Go over, get stopped right at the goal line, and uh, end up losing that game. So that was tough. Uh, what was that? 24-22. Close. close. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So then, major hurricane? Yeah, that's, that's big time. 320. Yeah, I mean, that's just being down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. That's right? the second half of yeah. throwing the ball every play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that ended up being a, it was that that was like after that game, even losing, that that was like the first like, all right, that, that's a, that that's going to be a national championship caliber team, and yeah. we just we just went toe to toe with them, you know, I ended up throwing the ball pretty well. It's a hurricane, like I can do this, like I, I can really play at a high level, and that really kind of triggered the, okay, that I'm going to be the guy here, and and this is going to be what I do, and I'm going to you know try to go get ourselves ourselves a national championship. And then later that year, is it the Fiesta Bowl you guys are in? Yep. What yep. what was the deal with? Joey Bosa, didn't he, like, throw your helmet in the ground or something? He did. No, no, no. He, your head it was a, he speared me. He speared you. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, that season. That hurt? Up, yeah. That, <laughs> not re- honestly, honestly, no. It, it hurt after the game, and looking yeah. at it, it was a bad shot. I'll get to that story. So, that, that rest of that season, we end up going undefeated up into the last game of the year against Stanford. It's the first ever Final Four we're getting in. Like, Stanford was just an okay team. And they ended yeah, up going to the Big Ten. Yeah, yeah but we freaking we, – we ended up in another end-of-game situation. Kevin Hogan takes them down to kick a field goal to win the game. So we end up in the Fiesta Bowl right outside the Final Four. And we show up to that freaking stadium against Ohio State. And it was very, very clear that we had no business playing against that <laughs> defense. I mean, they end up having like nine out of 11 guys in the field were yeah. either first-rounders that year, and they, they weren't the first-rounders that year. They're, they were after yeah. that. I mean, Malik Hooker was a backup, and they ended up being <laughs> the first round. I mean, every uh, the, the whole defensive line, the two linebackers, Eli Apple on one side, Denzel Ward is a, is a backup. On other, like, th- this mm-hmm. defense was nutso, and then obviously Joey Bosa. So we're playing, you know, and I get out there. I'm still getting, you know, getting my groove. We, we move the ball a little bit down the field. I get smacked like two or three times, though, and I'm like, wow, these guys can really hit. And um, now we're starting to lose. We're losing touch of the game. Mm-hmm. I roll out right, and I go to throw the ball back across the middle. I get the ball off just fine, and it just air mails right into the safety's hand. Pick. Uh-huh. So I'm looking at the pick the whole time, but little I know, Joey Bosa just got done spearing <laughs> me. So the, the, what you would think would be an injury or a bad hit, it was actually more like relief, like, oh, good, I have to take that <laughs> ball back. <laughs> Joey Bosa's out of the game. We actually have, have a chance here. Um, so, yeah, that, that ended up being a, a, a tough game for us. We lost Jalen Smith that game. But uh, that was a fun week in Scottsdale, I'll tell you that. <laughs> After that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's yeah. right. Fiesta Bowl's in, in Phoenix. That's right. Phoenix, yeah. yeah, yeah. New uh, Year's. No, yeah, New I know. Year's as well. P- Penn State played in the Fiesta Bowl, so I know. It wasn't when I was there, but I knew a bunch of guys, and they, say, were, they were hitting me up like, yeah, yeah they were like uh, yeah. talking about the, the Scottsdale scene. But uh, and then the next year you come back, right? Everyone thinks you're going to be the starting quarterback. I think everyone in the country thought it. And then it's an open competition in training camp, right, between you and Malik. Yeah. And then and then you guys start doing the good old rotate quarterback situation, tough. right? And, tough, and tough, Brian tough. Kelly makes that decision. What was what was that process like? Because it had to be tough. Like, you probably thought you were the starter, and then you realized that, you know, you got to go through all that competition again. Yeah, you know, when, when you go to the Fiesta Bowl and you have that type of year and you're coming back and you, you think that you're going to be a Heisman candidate and obviously starting to hear the buzz about maybe playing in the NFL, having all the, the intangibles that, that could you know turn into a decent NFL quarterback. You know, I'm comfortable, but at the same time, you know, once again, I, I didn't come to Notre Dame to be the next star. I wasn't yeah. Brian Kelly's pick. I didn't have him recruiting me, you know, coming to multiple high school games. So I understood that once Malik got back from his injury – I mean, the, the dude, you know, balled out in, the, in his first game. The yeah. year before that, actually, before the Texas game, he came in in the LSU game and balled out against LSU as well. So he, like, his, his only two outings before I started playing were, like, real outings. So I knew it was going to be a competition. I just assumed that I would edge it out. You know, when, when you play at that level the year before, almost make a Final Four, I, I would assume that, like, after maybe a couple weeks of training camp, I can show that, you know, I'm still yeah. the guy from the, the previous year and, and, and maybe we can make it happen. But – 
and BK decided to just let it go. He, he didn't like the concept of making a decision. He, he uh, clearly, his history um, with quarterbacks is that he likes competitions. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that a part of being a, a great quarterback is having that leadership and having yeah. that command and having that confidence in yourself and not having to deal with, you know, every time you miss a ball, thinking about whether or not another guy's going to come in. But, um, but yeah, so we go back and forth all off season. Um, go up the, the Thursday before game week against Texas, sit down, um, thinking like, all right, here it is. I'm about to get named the starting quarterback. I'm pretty confident I had a good training camp. And he says, you're both playing. <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, what? What do you mean? And then he was like, not only are you both playing, I want you to play every other drive. You're going to play every other drive. And then, you know, if someone edges out, we'll figure it out, but we're going to play every other drive. You got, you guys got two different styles. I'm like, no, we don't have two different styles. You know, he, yeah. yes, Malik is a better runner than me, but I'm going to run the same exact offense him, whatever. Um, so that, that game would go out. We play a Sunday night football game against Texas. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is the first week of college football. So Sunday night, there's no NFL football on. So it ended up being like one of the highest broadcasted games ever. Obviously, Texas has a crazy fan base, 110,000 fans. Mm -hmm. They're super excited about the game. We come to town and uh, play really, really, really well in the first half. I think we ended up scoring on every drive I was in. Uh, first drive that I ended up playing, throwing a nice little um, uh, red zone fade to Equinemia, St. Brown. That was great. Um, and Malik was, you know, he had, a, he had a decent game, but not a great one. I, but I played really well. I, I definitely edged him out in that game. So get to the second half. I end up closing out the game. We go into a couple overtimes and end up losing. Um, and then I end up winning a job back. But it was never like, uh, it's yours. Yeah. You know, it was a, yeah, you did better and we're going to go with you here. But yeah. you know, there was, after about two or three more games of like having a shaky year, there was multiple times where, where you're coming to the sideline thinking, all right, is he going to tap Malik or is he coming with me or is my, am I getting benched? And to the point where we even played against Stanford that year and I did get benched and then got brought back in in the end of the game to try to, you know, bring us back. So it was a bit of a mind game and didn't necessarily love that year. I ended up being a four and eight year. Well, what was your relationship with Malik like, like during that? Like was it tough like cool. when you were both doing that? No, we were, we were tight. We yeah. were homies because the year before – um, we both had um, college girlfriends who were at Ohio State. So we were taking this four-and-a-half-hour road trip on a regular so you're boys, during spring. Yeah. We're boys. <laughs> we're boys. I was going out there quite a, uh, quite a bit at the time, and he was too. So we, we became cool. Um, and, and that, but obviously we're both backups to Ever Golson. So, so that, that it. It, yeah. was, it was okay Different. to be cool then. But yeah. we, he's from Dayton. I'm from Toledo. We, you know, we kind of you know, move and, 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 and you know, hang out kind of the same way in the same scene. So um, we were cool that whole time. Now – that next year, though, once I kind of won the job, you know, Malik, I, as, as he should, you know, he, he, he's balled in every game that he's played in. Other yeah. than Texas, he played okay. Like, he thinks he needs to be a guy. And, and, and quite frankly, he's a great college quarterback. He probably yeah. should be a guy somewhere. So, it got a little shaky towards the end there. And I think that's why when I – even when I decided to leave and go to the NFL that year, he still decided to transfer to Florida because of that. But um, it, it was a – it just it just was a, a, a terrible year to be a part of that that, yeah. that, that issue of, of the quarterback switching. Yeah, defensive coordinator gets fired that year. We go four and eight. Don't go to a bowl game. First time Brian. Yeah, Kelly right after the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> right after yeah. <laughs> Almost like made the ball. final four. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. It's it's tough. The good tough. thing is probably like knowing you, you're probably mature enough to like be happy for him when he has success, but also be pissed that like it's not happening to you. You know, at the same time, and you guys are both probably mature enough to handle that. That's kind of like the balance of quarterback competitions all, all over the country, right? Like yeah. being able to like be a good teammate, but also like you're a competitor and want to be out there when the guy, other guy's doing well. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. Because I, cause I got a taste of like, wow, I could do this at a high level the year yeah. before. It wasn't like I had never figured it out. Like I, I, I had figured it out. I had figured out who I was as a quarterback, gained some confidence, was running the ball, was throwing the ball quite well that year before. So yeah, when, when, when you go from that and, and hearing the buzz of what could be and what yeah. you should be, and then all of a sudden you go back out there and you get dropped back down and you can't do the, you know, Manning passing camp in the offseason because you're, <laughs> you're in the competition. You can't do the media day with the team because you're still in that competition. Like that, that was that, that's Especially the, at Notre Dame, like exactly, the place, the biggest exactly, fan base in the yeah. – Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was tough. But, but at the end of the day, I, I – I, I learned a lot from it. You know, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about, you know, it's, it's you it's you versus you most of the time. You know, you can't – if you go out there and you get put on this pedestal and you think that, um, you know, you just – everything's just going to come easy, that's just not true. And, and, and obviously that, that carried over into the NFL quite a bit. Do, do you think that college and NFL teams can win rotating quarterbacks? Or do, are you kind of like – you think that they got to pick one? Because it's become kind of – 
more common in college football now to rotate quarterbacks. You see, like, Harbaugh did it for a couple of games at Michigan this past season. Like, what, what are your thoughts on Do you think it's possible to win like that? No. They're, they're, I, no. I don't, at, at the highest level, I don't think you're winning championships doing yeah. that. Do I think you can do it? Absolutely. But somebody has to be the guy. Like, you have to have a guy for the sake of the team, for the sake of the coaching staff, for the sake of the media, for the sake of your fans. Like, somebody has to be the guy. The, this yeah. game is built for the quarterback to be the coach out on the field. And yeah. if you're going back and forth and you have two different things, like, yeah, all of that, like, you're going to make the defensive coordinator think this and that. Like, no. That's, that, no. Yeah. Like, it, Someone's got to go win the game, right? Someone <laughs> has to go win the game. Yeah. So, so if you do have two different styles, right, if you do have – um, you know, a, a true pocket passing quarterback, and you do have a guy who's a little more electric running, like, yeah, give the electric guy who's running the, who can run the ball a little bit a couple packages, but let your, let your pocket passer be the guy, or vice versa, you know. Yeah. Give, give the guy who's going to run the ball and run your offense and know that that's your identity, but also know that you got a guy who can come in and run a two-minute drill if you need to. But, like, there needs to be a guy. You know, that, that's, that's a part of the game. Yeah. Thinking back to, you know, when I was at Penn, Penn State and – I think about Christian Hackenberg and Bill O'Brien and, like, how tight those two were. Yeah. You mentioned Brian Kelly and kind of how he didn't really recruit you that much. You know, you didn't really have a great relationship with him early on, which is kind of not that uncommon that freshman quarterbacks don't know their head coach that well or meet, or meet with him a ton. Do you feel like it developed as you got older and got into that starting role more? Or, you know, how did, how did your relationship with Brian Kelly kind of evolve and how do you think it impacted your career? Uh. To be honest, man, it didn't. It, it didn't yeah. evolve. You know, I didn't. We that that wasn't how that, that wasn't the 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 environment that was created when we were playing. Now, since then, I think a lot has changed. You know, since then, he's become much more of a players' guy. You know, just from the stories that I hear, you know, he's having people up at his lake house a couple years after us. He hires a team psychiatrist who's like, you know, thinking about the yeah. camaraderie. He's calming down a little bit. But when I my, during my time there, I didn't. Didn't really have a com- or have a relationship with Brian. You know, it yeah. was it was all ball. You know, we we only talked about ball. Um, we only you know we only saw each other out in the field. You know, there wasn't really a, a you know mano y mano situation there. So that that was a uh, you know once again I, I it's it's the reason why I feel so so strongly about there needs to be a guy and that guy needs to have a relationship and he needs to be yeah. the voice of the <laughs> team and and you, you know yeah. you need to trust in in his in his leadership and. And that wasn't necessarily my, my, my college situation because I had Malik Zaire. And, and, and you know, if, 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 there, if Malik didn't beat me out my first year, who knows? It could have been completely different. I think, you know, maybe quarterbacks before me probably wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't agree that that's how they were. You know, maybe a Tommy Reese or someone who played for quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Like, those guys might have had good relationships with BK. But for me, it, wasn't, it was never like that. It was, you know, I was, I was competing for my job every day. If I made yeah. a bad pass – he made sure I knew I made a bad pass and made sure I knew that there was another guy who was going to come take my job if I continued to do that. And, and it, it toughened me up. I think it made me better my, my, my rookie or my first year plan, but my sophomore year, man, I just wanted to go play. I know the offense. I can check us in and whatever you need me to check us into. Just give me the game plan and let's rock, you know. Yeah. But to, to have that back and forth was definitely a uh, – a little tough. At, yeah, you know, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. starting quarterback. Well, what was the decision like um, deciding to go to the NFL? Because you went to, to the NFL, uh, what, two years? Or, or you could have saved for two more years, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I redshirted, so I, c- I could have came back and played yeah. two more, you know, did the fifth-year thing. I, um, you know, there's a couple things. One, one, you know, th- this whole scenario was definitely a part of it. You know, like, I, if yeah. I was going to come Fresh back, start. like, yeah. yeah, who knows? I might come back and you might say that Brandon Winbush is now in the competition with That's me. Right, you yeah. know, like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm your guy <laughs> or not. Um, uh but then the other piece of it is like, look, I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a lot, but I grew up with enough, you know. But I definitely saw the opportunity to, you know, change my family's life. Um, that was always, that was always the mission, you know. It was always through business first, but now I had this real opportunity that I was gonna, you know, kind of beat the odds and, and have an opportunity to make some real money, you know. When I had, when I when I thought about coming back and maybe getting injured or. Uh, you know, ended up in another quarterback competition and losing my job or something. Like I, I had to maximize that opportunity right then and there to, uh, you know, be able to to you know, buy my my family a home and 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 you know really kind of take that transition. I can always come back and get my degree. You know, yeah. yeah. And once you once you get that stamp as a Notre Dame quarterback, I think it's just as valuable as the diploma itself. You know, I don't know, know if you necessarily need that. You're still going to get that, you know, that relationship Respect, across yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ac- across the country with that network. What what was your draft process like? Like wh- where where did you train at? What was what was that? Because that's like almost 
a whole nother recruiting process with the agent process, the where you're training at as a quarterback. Yeah, you got is. you need to pick a quarterback trainer, oh, right? Yeah. It's oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. everyone's recruiting you all over again. Yeah, yeah. So I um, I end up signing with Athletes First, who uh, Kyle McCarthy, who was a, a Notre Dame captain, safety, played in the league for a little while, had became an agent just before that, and came back and started recruiting me. But he was a coach. He came back and coached at Notre Dame as well while I was there. So I got to really know K-Mac well. He knew my family before that. And then he went and partnered with the, the president of Athletes First, Brian Murphy, and to go half and half with me. It was the, you know, the Athletes First family. I absolutely love everyone over there. Savannah, Danielle, um, you know, K-Mac, all those guys, are, they're amazing. And so I, I, it was an easy decision there. I definitely, you know, I, I called in some of the other agencies, CAA and, and a couple of other spots to just see what, you know, if we can create a little bit of leverage against them. But I always knew I wanted to be with A1. Another reason for that is I loved visiting Newport Beach because that's, yeah. that's where the whole pre draft process was. They had, a, they had a, a facility that we all worked out of. They had a, a, a nice little, um, you know, commercial uh, rental forest to all stay for three months beautiful right next to the beach it was you know, really nice for me um, ended up doing my quarterback training uh, with uh, Zach Robinson who didn't really have a big uh, quarterback before me quite frankly he was he was working for PFF at the time but he worked with another group that I ended up spending a lot of time with 3DQB um, and knew a lot of the the fundamentals there I like Zach Zach was good friends with K Mac he felt like he kept it in the circle but um, this is a long-winded way of getting to, you know, my, my whole pre-draft process, our whole mission, our thesis, our brand was going to the bunker. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, when, when you go to Notre Dame, by nature, people are going to question your love for football. They're going to, you know, I, once again, I made a decision to go there for the business school. I, 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 I didn't really hide that. You know, that was, that was why I chose that over Alabama or LSU. So, um, you know, a lot of GMs, a lot of head coaches are going to now ask that question, like, are, are you really about ball? And uh, we thought the best way to, to, to answer that question was to not show up in any marketing, not show up in any media, just go into the bunker, get my body right. I finished up my career at like 250, 252 pounds. A big, I think. Boy. big boy. Big, big boy. boy. Big boy. Big <laughs> boy. Running quarterback power game right up the middle trying to run over <laughs> linebackers. Didn't care. Um, so, you know, I wanted to get in good shape, wanted to show that I was committed to the game. Um, so I went into, you know, in, into the bunker for a while and, and, you know, cut off a bunch of weight. And I think weighing in at the combine at 233, cut off like 4 or 5% body fat. So, um, you know, really wanted just to, to show all the GMs that like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to yeah. commit to ball. We're, we're, we're going to talk about one of none for a while in a little bit. But you just mentioned kind of going to the bunker, people questioning your love for football. Uh, were you, your whole time at Notre Dame, were you thinking of, like, were you an entrepreneur back then? Like, were you thinking, like, I want to start a business? Um, were you, like, reading the Wall Street Journal every morning? Like, <laughs> what was your mindset with that compared to, you know, being a quarterback at Notre Dame? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it really goes back from before I even made that decision to go to Notre Dame. You know, my, my dad told me, I tell a story uh, uh, once in a while, you know, my dad told me back in fifth grade, I remember Vividly, I was getting ready to go to an AAU practice. It's about two hours away, Lima, Ohio, mm-hmm. um, and I was throwing a fit. I just didn't want to drive, you know, two hours just to go practice with these guys. Like we're not even playing in the game. Like, and then the coach that was down there was all about defense, and it's like, bro, it's AAU basketball. I'm just trying to have fun. Like I'm not trying to go down there and do freaking zigzag <laughs> drills. My dad knew that was going to make me, uh, you know, make me a lot better. So he wanted me to go. So I'm throwing a fit, and my dad is a police officer. So he would pick me up in, in his police car to take me home and he would you know, we would quick he would quickly go drop the car off and we'd hop in the car and go to AU practice. So I'm sitting in the back of the police car throwing a fit. And my dad pulls it over and says, Son, there's only two ways you're gonna go to uh, that you're gonna go to college. You're either gonna go to the military or you're gonna get a college scholarship for sports. I don't have any money for you to go to college. And he was like, you got to make a decision right here now. I don't care what you decide. I will support you in whatever you do. But, like, that, those are your two options because you're going to go to college. I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go play, you know, I'm going to go play sports and completely fix my attitude, went down there and had a great practice. But, you know, that, that to me was always kind of the roots of, you know, my dream was never to be an NFL star. My dream was never to play in the NBA. My dream was never to play in the MLB. My dream was just to get the best college education because that's what my dad – brought up every single day, every time we would work out, every time yeah. I would, you know, make a decision on whether or not I was going to prom or not or homecoming or not. It was, you know, did you do something today to further put yourself in a position to get a great college scholarship? And 
you know, that was just how he, he raised me, and I loved him for it. I mean, I, I, I plan on raising my kids the same exact way. It was a clean mission, and it was really easy for me socially and academically and spiritually and, and obviously within athletics to just dedicate all things to getting to that, and it was a really good direction for me. But then once I got there, then, you know, I, once again, I was just a potential football guy. I, I <laughs> actually I, I like playing baseball the most. I, mm. Basketball is my first love. Football is like my third sport. Like, I, that was just something I happened to be good at. But yeah. not a lot of six, you know, four athletic quarterbacks, quarterbacks who could yeah. throw the ball 60 yeah. yards on the field. So I ended up being what I ended up being the best at. But, um, uh, you know, so when I got to Notre Dame, I got there with that mindset of, like, I'm going to get the best degree possible. I'm going to go to this business school. I'm going to figure out how to get the most out of this. You know, I, I'd rather have a 40-year career in, in football or a 40-year career in business and be super successful than come out here and give my all the ball at LSU and end up, you know, if I don't make it to the league, then all of a sudden I'm selling used cars down in Louisiana <laughs> or something. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to try to get the best out of this. Um, so a lot of my off time I spent with the guys in the dorm, you know, uh, Pat, my co-founder on, on one of them. Um, yeah. you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of conversations that were about, you know, what do we want to do with this? You know, first, what is business school? You know, what are your options? What are your, what are your paths? You know, um, Notre Dame was very, very, very adamant that there's really two paths in the business school and finance. You're either going down the accounting route, mm-hmm. um, in which you're trying to go to the big eight or, or, or big eight, eight, oh. Big, big four yeah. in accounting, and then it's kind of like the big eight in, in, in investment banking. Or you're going to go down the investment banking route and, do, yeah. and go to one of the big banks. You know, if you go to Goldman, you go to Bain, you you won Mendoza. You, be, you beat yeah. your class. You so. were definitely an investment banking guy, not not accounting, right? That was first, yeah, yeah. 100%. 100%. I thought I was accounting. <laughs> I thought I was accounting until yeah. all of a sudden I was in, I was in uh, accounting one, and I got to the final and knew absolutely you were nothing. Screwed. <laughs> Enter my best friend at the time, Pat, Pat <laughs> who had to teach me how to do yeah. a complete uh, cash flow statement that flew, that, that was going to flow right into a, uh, a P&L, so that, that was – or balance sheet. So that, that was a, a – Quickly, I was like, all right, I'm going to go into investment banking. They make a little more money over there. And then yeah. Pat would always tell me, he was like, dude, if you're going to be an accountant, like, anybody can be an accountant. You don't even need a personality to be an accountant. <laughs> like, you're the quarterback of Notre Dame, bro. Like, go do something that's, like, fun and cool. Um, so I took the investment banking track, but then quickly realized Pat and I both – or Pat, Pat realized after going down the investment banking path and then caused me to realize that, like, yo, that's not even it either. Like, why yeah. do we, why do we got to go work 80-hour weeks – and do two hours of uh, shit's brutal, I, brutal, bad, like, absolutely yeah. brutal. Yeah. Like, why do we got to go do that? Like, why can't we just skip that and go to private equity or venture or start our own thing? Like, let's let's do something different. So, um, we kind of bonded over that and just start coming up with crazy ideas on on a pretty much a weekly basis and writing them down. And um, so so you know, you brought this up when it goes to the NFL now. That that was really my college experience. Like, yeah, I'm balling out in the field. I'm playing well, but. My free time, I'm still going back and kicking it with Pat and talking finance and thinking about business and how we're going to leverage the, the new QR technology that was coming out at the time yeah. to come up with something really dope. I think that was still a great idea, yeah. synchronized with the QR. Yeah. And the <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so you really you were using football at that point to like get to the place you want to go in the business world almost. And, and you were going to maximize football, but it was always, I want to go build a big business and 100%. be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my hobby – after my – so my, that, that redshirt freshman year, that year that I ended up playing, we go to the Fiesta Bowl. I get back for spring, and I'm talking to Pat, and this is when I'm first really learning about investment banking. We're still kind of on that path for a little while. Um, and I went to Pat saying, like, yo – or Pat comes to me saying, like, uh, how, I don't know how you're going to get a good banking job. Like, one, the, every banker that, that ends up at Bain or Goldman, you know, 80% of those are interns before they get there. They just mm-hmm. pick one of the interns to be the or to stay. Like a group yeah. to stay. Yeah. So, like, you can't get an internship. So, like, I don't know how you're going to do this, man. Like, that's another reason why you shouldn't be in investment banking because you're not uh-huh. going to be able to compete with those guys. So, I was like, well, I need to figure out how to get an internship. He was like, well, what does your summer look like? I was like, I got three weeks in May. You know, we, we, we finish up school after the first week of May. We, we then go – um, you know, back to summer football the first week of June. He was like, well, let's see if we can get something done in three weeks. I was like, I'd be down. How do I do that? And he was like, well, you're the starting quarterback at Notre Dame. You can get anybody on the phone. <laughs> Just, like, pick a business that has a Notre Dame grad in it, yeah. and you should be able to be okay. So I was like, all right, let's figure this out. So Pat sat down. He was like, all right, we're going to go through LinkedIn, and we're going to come up with a list of all of the top executives that are running big corporations that we think could be cool mm-hmm. that are Notre Dame grads, and you're going to send them an email with a subject title, NDQB seeking, or seeking advice. And I was like, 
deal. The easy. He was like, dude, of course they're going to answer that. And like, we're going around talking to everyone like, yeah, look what he just said. Like, yeah. they're like, yeah, of course he's going to answer, but we don't have anyone's emails. So now we're sitting there thinking to ourselves like, all right, how, or what, 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 or how do you figure out someone's email? Is it, is it first name, last name at, you know, Goldman.com or is it first dot or first initial dot, dot, dot last name? <laughs> first not. So we would just start typing them all in 80% of those bounce back, you know, yeah. just didn't, didn't make it home. But then there's those other 20% like shit, if it didn't bounce back, it must've got to key Sharon, the CEO of GE capital. It has to get to him. Right. And all of a sudden key Sharon's assistant hits us back. Absolutely. Keith would love to have a conversation with you. And I call Keith. I'm sitting there with Pat. I'm getting super nervous before the call. And Pat gives me this little script. We're going back and forth and what I'm going to say. And I'm like, look, essentially, I, I need an internship. I would like to get into to finance somehow. I'm not necessarily, you know, into corporate finance, but there's not a lot of programs out there that I can take in the banking space. Could you put together a program for me to do like a three week internship so I can at least get some experience? And he was blown away by the, that concept that all these college athletes across the, the, the U.S., you know, didn't have that opportunity for that. So yeah. he built this program for athletes at GE Capital at the time. And I went out there and did this cool profitability um, uh, project over three weeks there in their aviation department and got some real experience. And then that uh, went back to school and, and started that competition against Malik in the second year. I didn't realize how big of a role Pat had in the whole in the whole oh, DK's yeah. college life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was like he was. He was my he was my ear to the ground. He the the thing is he was just a year above me. So like yeah. when when I'm taking just like the the intro courses the, he's the been intro there. yeah he's yeah. already he's already yeah. done that right. So he yeah. knows what, he knows what people to you know what uh, what professors to take. Once I start getting into finance classes, yeah. he's one step ahead of me. And quite frankly, I'm not studying as hard as I should study. Pat knows all this, so I'm gonna go yeah. to Pat and like you know can you quickly teach yeah. me how to do this? And I know that we can communicate at yeah. a high level. You're gonna do better than the professor. So. Um, Pat was just like taking all of his learnings and then bringing them down to me and then kind of using the quarterback uh, situation to be like, all right, let's go see if we can skip the lines. Like if I, if he was just kind of saying, if I was in your position, what would I do? And, and ended up, you know, with a so, nice GE internship. So he was Deshaun Kaiser was like career counselor during college, right? <laughs> you could say that. You could say that. I think that makes and, sense. And for context, Pat is Deshaun's co-founder at One of None. So yeah. just for context, when we're talking about Pat, we'll talk about One of None yeah. in a little yeah. bit. But yeah. I got a super off track on the business talk. I was trying to save yeah. it for later, but yeah. uh, but I love it. It's yeah. and it's such a big part of who you are and, and like how you got and and then. Your time through Notre Dame. How hard was Notre Dame business school, by the way? That was my other thing. It was tough. Thing. Oh, it was, it was like really actually tough. tough? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Th- it's funny. You you would think at, in most at most universities, you would think being the quarterback of the school makes it easier. Yeah. And I would always joke, and I'm like, and I still believe in my heart that like me being the quarterback at Notre Dame mm-hmm. made things harder. It made yeah. it harder to socialize. It made it harder in school because yeah. it's not like at Notre Dame they they, they don't care. I mean, they, they love yeah. football. They love you. They, they know who you, you are. are. Yeah. yeah, but they're they're trying to create a nice little yeah. pipeline to be the big the best business school in the in the country. Like yeah. they, they they'll love you, but just go do something else. Go do you know television or something. Don't don't come in. Yeah. The, if you want to come to the Mendoza School of Business, you're going to have to compete with with these top dogs with the Pats of the world. You probably surprised a lot of them. I'm sure like they were probably like surprised, uh, shocked that you. Yeah, but like I wasn't. I, I, I'm a I'm a talker. I can get through it. Yeah. I can understand the numbers, but I wasn't like a I wasn't a I wasn't a geek. I yeah. wasn't like locked in. Like these people who are who are trying to get into Goldman in. and get into yeah. they're all in. They're watching the markets. Yeah. I'm not watching the markets at the time. I don't understand how to yeah. like they they understand the concept of finance and then they then they're learning it. I don't yeah. even know what the concept of finance is. I just know I want to be rich and be a businessman. <laughs> and Pat yeah. says that in order to do so, you either you become an accountant or you, go to, or you become a finance. You have a personality. You're going into investment banking or you're starting yeah. your own business. I was like, yeah. all right, deal. That's the path I'm it. taking. I love it. Shout out, Pat. Shout I love out, Pat. Um, <laughs> all right, back to football. Yeah, back to football. Back to football. That's right. Oh, I got us off track. Uh, the draft process. Yeah. And then you're through training. What was the talk? Were, were people thinking that you were going to be QB one at all? Were there any talks about it? Like, what, like what was? I don't really remember that time. Like, what was in the I know, draft? I know, yeah, in the draft. Like, there were there a lot of. I know I saw a couple of mock drafts, mock drafts that had you as as the first quarter I picked, and then like, what was that? What was the talk around it? And then like, how it actually played out? Yeah. So, so you know, I had a once again, I had a really good redshirt freshman year. Yeah. And then my that we go four and eight the next year. So like, that's a real question mark. Like I'm yeah. I, I'm yeah. six four six five. Clearly, you know, well spoken. And big arm yeah. have all have why wasn't the starter right? yeah <laughs> yeah why isn't he the starter yeah. are you a good teammate like why are you guys losing like what, what is going on what what makes you this and I think that that's why we decided to go into bunker so I can just answer those questions in person um, and, and do it in a thoughtful way so I yeah the the, the quarterbacks in that draft were um, uh, Deshaun Watson Pat Mahomes myself Mitch Trubisky 
uh, Davis Webb. Those were the, the, the top guys. Davis Webb. Davis Webb. <laughs> Davis Webb goes in the third round. Yeah. Yeah, shout out. And we can get into that conversation. We were, we were talking about okay. that a little yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, out of that, it's, it's t- to be honest, I, to tell you the truth, I thought it was, it was Deshaun Watson, then myself, then Mitch Trubisky, and then um, uh, Pat Mahomes after that. Mm-hmm. At the time, Pat Mahomes is a gunslinger at Texas Tech, but the Big 12, I mean, are you really playing yeah, real? Everyone's, yeah, slinging, everyone's yeah. slinging it. You know, everyone yeah. has stats on there. Um, so that's, uh, that's how I thought the order was going to go. I thought Deshaun Watson would go to, to go to Cleveland. You know, they had the first and the third pick. Mm-hmm. I thought he was going to go to Cleveland, and then all of a sudden you had all these quarterback needy teams. You had the Bills. You had the Niners. You had um, Kansas City. You had uh, Arizona. There's all these teams that are super interested in, in taking a guy. Mm-hmm. And I have great meetings with them all. I mean, Arizona Cardinals. I mean, they 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 call me in for a second workout. They're you know they call me the, the day before saying Are you ready to be a Cardinal. I'm like yeah, and that was like the twenty. They were they were they, I think they're in the, the mid teens yeah. and then the twenty. So I'm like and, yeah. And when you say good. meetings, like what what are those like like meetings where what like so so you have the first the first one is you go on a thirty visit. Yeah. You know you have your you have your pro day. They come yeah. and check you out at pro day. So I meet them. Then you have your thirty visit, so I go out to Arizona, um, you know, spend some time Steve with the Kime, GM, yeah. yeah, Steve Kime, and loved it, absolutely loved it. Steve Kime, uh, uh, I bet, coach, yeah. coach, yeah, coach, Arizona. coach Aaron's, um, that that was awesome, and the, these guys love ball. And then yeah. Brian uh, Byron Leftwich is now the um, the at the time I believe the quarterback coach, and he's like going to be this new stud. And, you know, coach coach was getting older, and and we knew that uh, he was going to come and take it over. So. I was really excited to go there and, and, and ended up having a really good workout. So I thought that that, like, that was like my backstop. If I get to Arizona, psh, I'm going Sweet. to Arizona. Yeah. And, I, yeah. I mean, go live in Scottsdale? Like, yeah. hell yeah, this is going to be dope. Um, dangerous. Dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> um, but I uh, – so get, get to draft day, got to make a tough decision. Do you want to go to draft? Draft was in Philly. Oh, was it? Yeah, That's draft right. was in Philly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, do you want to go to draft? And I'm like – you know, I graded out as a two when I when I when I got when you know the NFL gives you a grade after your your year to tell you whether or not you should go to the NFL. I got graded out a two, second round. Mm-hmm. So that, that it wasn't like a sure thing I was going to be a first rounder. I wasn't even like a one two. I was just a two. Yeah. Um, but there's but once again, there's only a few quarterbacks. There's a lot of quarterback needy teams. Like you know, if I'm going to get invited, such I, a cool opportunity. Such did a cool your family opportunity. want you to go? Family went out yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they put you up the whole red carpet. My sister got to rock the red carpet with me. That was yeah. awesome. I, I, I ended up saying, yeah, I'll go. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you sit down and, you know, family gets there. I'm nervous. I, I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know. I might, I might yeah. go in the first, I could go top five. I could go third <laughs> round. I have no idea. I'm so like, I'm, I'm definitely not, you know, you got Jamal Adams walking in there, swagging out, you know, like <laughs> just knowing he's getting ready to get a bag. Like I'm sitting here kind of, I'm nervous. So yeah. So we sit down um, at our table, a little nervous, got my agent there, got my high school coach with me, got my whole family with me. And you see the different pockets of people and uh, you know, the, the little chime goes off, and Roger Goodell comes out. Everyone boos him, and it's like, <laughs> wow, I'm here. I'm doing this. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. swagged. I got a Goodell's nice little getting booed. Yeah. They were here. <laughs> yeah, this is happening. This is happening. And it's like, all right, who's going first? You know, so I'm looking at it's either Deshaun Watson or it's uh, or it's um, Miles Garrett. And I'm like, Miles Garrett, boom, cool, love it. That, that was yeah. predictable, number one overall pick, incredible. Now you got the, oh, Chicago Bears. I even mentioned Chicago earlier. They're, they're 100% a quarterback in the team. Mm-hmm. Chicago Bears. Um, trade up, and it was like, holy crap, here goes Deshaun Watson. He's going to Chicago. Wait, what? And you kind of see, like, another table in the back, and someone stands up and does the whole hug thing. It was Mitch. And we're like, wow. Mitch That's just right. went. Yeah, Mitch and went we were down. like, what the hell just happened? Like, we, <laughs> you know, Deshaun Watson is like, I mean, we just had, had Dabble Sweeney saying he's the next MJ of football. Like, yeah. what, what what's happening here? Um, so Mitch goes, but now I'm thinking to myself, like, dang. I was expecting that to be a little later. Like, I don't know if that just messed up where I'm going to be able to get drafted at. And then, you know, a couple picks go by. And Kansas City comes up, takes Pat Mahomes. Holy crap. DW's still out there. What's going yeah. on? Like, how, how did that happen? And then he ended up going to Houston. So now we're midway through. I think we're in the teens when, they, when all three of those guys get picked. I'm like, all right, you still have Buffalo. You still have San Francisco. And you still have Arizona. That need quarterbacks, and in Cleveland as well. But yeah. Cleveland, Cleveland's yeah, Cleveland actually had a pick in the, t- in the in the late twenties as well. So that's that's four teams that still need a quarterback. We should be good, you know. Yeah. Like 
We're, we're, we're going to sit here. We're going to take a deep breath. You're probably going to see 10 picks go by, but you get to the late 20s. We should be all right. I, should, I might be able to be like the, the, the 31st pick. That would be great. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all those teams come up, and Hassan Riddick gets picked. And then, um, gosh, what was it? Uh, I'm not going to remember. But a couple other picks go by, and all those teams end up, you know, making their selections. And all of a sudden, there's a couple guys left who are sitting there with their families, and exactly what you expect that that feeling to to kind of loom over you it did exactly that. It feels like the whole world just ends. Dark clouds come over you, you know. Uh, just so much weight on you. You got your whole family. You got to walk out and get on a golf cart. It was me and Kevin King um, who didn't get drafted as well. He ended up being the first pick of the second draft. And he ended up being my dog in Cleveland because we shared, or in, uh, in, in Green Bay when I got to Green Bay because we shared that moment together. Mm-hmm. So we walk out, we hop in the car. Um, you know, the NFL says they would really love for you to come back. Like they would really love for you to come back the next day. And I'm like, absolutely not. I can't come back here. So I fly my whole family home and. Hey, we're going to do this draft party in Toledo. You know, we're going to change yeah. it up, pretend like that never happened. We're having a good time in Toledo. And, uh, you know, second round starts. Pick 32, 33, or pick 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. Holy sh- what's going on here? <laughs> like, uh, Buffalo I, still doesn't do? <laughs> take me again. San Francisco doesn't take me. Green Bay yeah. call, they, they don't take me at the, fir- the first pick of the second round. And all of a sudden, all you see is this, like, this, this Cleveland 52 pick. And then you see another, like, 25 picks after that before one of those quarterback needy teams come up. So it's like, if I don't get picked at 52, I'm going to the third round. And I was just in Philly thinking I was getting drafted in the first. That would be so embarrassing. Um, and as uh, 51 wraps up, get this this call on my phone. The area code says Berea, Cleveland, or Berea, Ohio. I go outside to the balcony of, of the, you know, one of the nicer hotels in Toledo, Ohio. And, and uh, here I'm getting drafted to Cleveland. They're sending the car service for my family, and we're out in the morning. Go out, have a great time that night, and and uh, be, try to become the hometown hero. So when when they called, were you still like a little bit upset you didn't go in the first round, or were you like cloud nine, like life's changed forever? Life's changed forever because because yeah. now because now I'm seeing third round. Now I'm like, don't embarrass yeah, yourself. You, were just you know, like, it's like yo, just get go. drafted. Yeah, just get drafted. Like at least yeah. like I'm I'm still looking at like I'm I'm looking at the the little curve of the of the, at, of the signing bonus. Sign, so I was like, saying, there's, still, there's still some M's in this area. Like yeah. all right, all right, all right, we're gonna be all right. Yeah. We're gonna be all right. Yeah. When you left uh, Philly. On the first night, yeah. what was your mindset? I mean, you're pretty level-headed. Like, were you, like, were you down bad? Or were you, like, still, like, telling your uh, – maybe your mo- your family might have been more upset than you were, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, yeah. where, what, what was your mindset? No, I was down pretty bad. Yeah. I, was, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get flustered much. Like, I wasn't down bad to where, like, I'm throwing things. I'm not one who, like, goes goes crazy. But, like, I, that was, like, the first time I kind of, like, you know, snapped back a little bit. And my mom trying to get me to stay. And I'm like, Mom, we're going home. You know, like, yeah. that was the first time I've ever done anything like that. So, like, I was definitely I was definitely hurt. So, that must have been cool to go to go to Cleveland. Yeah, you know? it was cool. It was cool. Now, now I was, like, really excited. I, You know, I grew up playing in Toledo, cold, cold weather games. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to go somewhere, either play in a dome or go somewhere where I get, like. <laughs> and you go to Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, dang, like, here I am going right down the street, right yeah. where I was just playing, you know. Um, but it was awesome. Like, I I, I really like Sashi Brown, the GM. I really like Hugh Jackson. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a really cool and unique opportunity. Um, and they had Brock Osweiler that just got done, you know, taking over his contract. So mm-hmm. I thought I'd have an opp- opportunity to learn. But it was really, like, to call it what it is, it was like they were 1-15 in 15 a year before. What can go wrong? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little you know. can't be worse than that. <laughs> can't be worse than that, right? I, even, if I, even if we go out there and, and lose, you know, majority of the season, that, yeah. And, uh, and as you know, that it ended up going downhill from there. So, okay. So, what was the process like from when you get to Cleveland to when it all kind of goes downhill and the uh, terrible season, and you know, you guys go, what? What was it? Oh, and whatever. Oh, and sixteen. 16. Yeah, like, 16. what was? Talk me through those couple, you know, the time between yeah, so, that. So when I first get out there, absolutely lit. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it was awesome. Yeah. You know I mean, Cleveland, like the the the, uh, for better or for worse, the 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 kind of mantra around the team, the energy mm-hmm. around the team was just it was it felt like pro sports. You yeah. Know? Did everyone around the city like you were walking downtown? 100%. Everyone knew who you were. Hundred percent. Your name. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Everyone. Everyone knows who you are. You know. You know. You got. Uh, Joe Hayden, who, who's a, you know all pro corner, he's pulling up in either his ghost or his Rafe or his <laughs> Lamborghini. You got you know we got three first three first round rookies. So you got Jabril Peppers. You got 
uh, Miles Garrett and David Njoku. You know, David Njoku. David, has a, yeah. yeah. He has the autobiography, you know, like when he <laughs> takes his signing bonus and goes and gets that. Like, we, you know, it felt like playing pro football. You know, yeah. Christian Kirksey has a Lamborghini truck. Like, we – we were we were really Christian Kirk you know, was in Cleveland. Uh, C- Christian Kirksey. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Back, or, uh, linebacker. Yeah, yeah, he. Um, but like it, it felt like a true pro team, you know. And I, uh, you know, uh, the the Cavs that off season are in the finals. That's right. You know, 2016 yeah. finals against uh, uh, Golden State. I'm showing up to the game courtside with you know a nice little yeah. T-shirt on. Paparazzi. Yeah, right? paparazzi. <laughs> I got this whole thing figured out. They put yeah. they put the camera on me, yeah. you know, and, and, and go on the big on the big try. And the other on the Megatron there, but um, it was cool, you know, leading up to the season, and um, but didn't really expect to play. You know, Cody Kessler was playing the season before, and you know they went one in fifteen, but he was a, he was a rookie at the time. Like he he could be he's you know has a real shot there. We just got Brock Osweiler. You know he had a great year in Denver. Obviously got a bag. Went down to um, Houston. Didn't play so hot, and everyone knew that it was a bit of a a. Uh, you know, a, a a contract deal where we were looking to get picks when we picked him up. But I thought he was still going to have an opportunity yeah. to really play. Like, it was all guaranteed money. So, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to come in here. I'm going to learn. Yeah. And you're good this with that, right? Great. You're oh, good with not playing. Great. Yeah. Sec- yeah, second round. Yeah. I'm not – there's no pressure on me. I can learn. I can really figure out this football mm-hmm. thing, you know. Like, this is my first time of being – I'm going to go all ball. Balls to the wall. This is only – this is the only thing I'm going to think about. I'm going to be great at, at quarterback. There's nothing else for me to think about. I'm, I made a decision to leave school early. There's no more – you know, indie QB sinking advice business stuff. Like, let's just go get this, you know, the, the, yeah. the opportunity in front of us to make the, make the best of it. So I ended up, uh, uh, you know, going into that off, going into that training camp free, you know, just, just completely free a lot, just trying to ball, you know, there's no, there's no pressure on me. You know, you're the rookie guy. I'm running around, you know, throwing, the, throwing passes that I probably shouldn't even attempt, but like, <laughs> I, I got nothing, I got nothing yeah. to lose. I'm the third string or fourth string quarterback at the time. We had Kevin Hogan as well, who's, who was in his second year. So by, by seniority, I'm going number four, didn't really care. Um, but then got to, you know, midway through training camp and all of a sudden I'm coming up with the two. So I'm, you know, I get past Kevin and then, you know, I'm competing with Cody to be the backup. Um, Brock Osweiler in our, in our, our brown and orange scrimmage at the beginning of the year starts that off. So it's like, all right, now, now it's me and Cody with the twos. I do okay there. Now we go to preseason. Brock starts the first game. I think I come in last of that preseason game, but I, I throw a game-winning touchdown, so I'm feeling myself a little bit. Um, and then all of a sudden we get to preseason game three, and I get named a starter. And I'm like, oh, wow. Because you balled out in preseason, right? I balled out. Yeah. I balled yeah. out. But preseason, like, it's easy to ball out in preseason. Yeah. You know, they, they, yeah. play, they play one covers yeah. the whole game. You know, yeah. like, as long as you have uh, receivers who can catch the ball, if you can push the ball down the field, like, it, you're going to be fine in preseason. I think you see a lot of that with, you know, young quarterbacks who are, who are coming in. Um, but, yeah, ball. So, I end up winning the job. Um, I'm still having a hard time calling the plays in the huddle. But, you know, we'll figure it out. You know, I'm going to be all right. What do you mean a hard time? Like they're just so long, like so long. wristband? No wristband. Hugh oh. Jackson was a big, big. big so he was no reading them to you in the oh headset. You need to remember him. Can you oh. give me an example of a play? Hundred percent. I remember my first play ever that, was that I had to call. So I get named the starter, uh. and the hardest part of practice for me as I, after I get named the starter is that freaking walkthrough before the practice. Oh yeah, because it is all eyes on you. No one else is on the field. You can't like mm-hmm. go into the huddle and pretend like your headset was off. Like. You're literally standing next to Hugh Jackson. He calls the play. You got to walk in and regurgitate, regurgitate the play. First play, first time being named a starter. You got Hall of Fame, uh, Joe Thomas at left tackle. You got all these top dogs in there. I go staring in there. at you. <laughs> yeah, and Hugh Jackson. I go up to Hugh Jackson. Hugh Jackson says, "All right, Deshaun, here we go. We got trips right off. Why counter motion? We got deep pass ninety six. Uh, yeah, deep pass ninety six. Um, F sale X dagger." kill with 95 open the kill was going to be if, if they went to a uh, single high and rotated to the strong side we're going to go weak side and just run and run that i was like all right bet go into the huddle all right guys we got trips right <laughs> deep hold on hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I go back over coach i need one more time one more time all right he said you know you got trips right why counter motion you know we got D pass 96, F sale, X dagger, kill it, 95 open. All right, got it, cool. All right, guys. We got Y counter motion, trips. Deshaun, what the? One sec, one sec. Go back over there. He says it one more time. And he, I, get, I remember after the third time, I look back at him again like, Coach, I don't got it. And he was like, are you fucking me? 
I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't got it. He was like, bro, you got to be, you got, you got to be kidding me. Like you had this script. Like how could you not figure that out? I'm like, coach, that is a long play. Like I'm used to, used to, <laughs> you know, with a, a couple signals, of signals. Yeah. yeah, and you go up and say 61, the yeah. offense line's good, and you're ready to rock. Now for me to go into huddle is tough. But um, it, it was all great learning plans, though, because if you really understand the offense and you're not relying on the wristband, you're not breaking the huddle and looking at your wristband and not looking at the defense, it's all things that I, I really think that – if you're a rookie quarterback, you, you should try not yeah. to wear a wristband because you're going to become better. And over time, I figured it out, but but uh, we just didn't figure it out. We just so team. so Hugh Jackson was cool. Like during that whole process, was he was he cool with you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was, what he was tough yeah, on the he quarterback. Was my, he was yeah. my, no, he was my head coach. This is yeah. the first time that I felt like I had someone who had my back. When I first got the the starting job, you yeah. know, Hugh Jackson comes to me, says, "Hey, look, I stood on the table for you. You know, we were considering taking Mitch. I took you. You know, you're going to be my guy, Sashi Brown. You know, great G, great GM at the time. You know, we were super excited. You're going to be my guy. I was like, all right, awesome. Um, so, so I don't know anything about NFL football. You know, so I'm I'm just listening to Hugh. Yeah. You said that they had some great years in Cincinnati doing this stuff. So if we do that stuff, we should be great. Cool. I'm going to go out there and do exactly what Hugh Jackson asked me to yeah. do every day. So I'm going to become an NFL quarterback. You know, he was coaching Andy Dalton. That was the film that we were turning on was Andy Dalton and Cody Kessler. Mm -hmm. I need to, in order for me to be great in Hugh Jackson's offense, I need to be Andy Dalton or Cody Kessler, or, you know, a, a, a Cody Kessler yeah. that, that, you know, maybe can do a couple more things and win a couple more games. Perfect. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, but, you know, very quickly, you know, we came out, played against the Steelers game one. I played pretty well, actually. We actually had a chance to beat the Steelers. So that mm -hmm. was actually good. You know, we got off that game and everyone just kind of nodded their head like, all right, we're going to be all right. We're decent. Yeah, yeah we're going to be we're going to be decent. You know, Big Ben is over at, in Pittsburgh. That's a great football team. We, we competed mm -hmm. with them. Then the next week was, you know, kind of similar. And the next week was similar. The next thing you know that, you know, we're starting to lose four, five, six games. And, and you know, my biggest regret in that whole time was that I never once – said, fuck it, I'm just going to go play ball. You know, every my, my time there, my time playing was like, how can I be Andy Dalton on tape? Yeah. It was like, how do I run, you know, a good pass fake and come out of the pass fake, and before the guy runs his lightning route, I got the ball on the outside shoulder so we can get 10 yards on first down. That was all I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking about what got me there. Yeah. And as you look back, what got me there was running. What yeah. got me there was making big plays. Yeah, being DK. Was being, yeah, it was yeah. being me. You know, in, in high school, once again, we were throwing the ball six, seven, eight times a game. My big plays in high school were running the football when the end would crash, yeah. and now I'm coming around the side, and I'm going to try to run over a defensive back. Like, I, I, I wish that at some point in time along the way that I would have put my foot in the ground and said, all right, you're 0-8. Maybe, maybe I need to stop trying to be Andy Dalton and start being a little more me. And I, I never did. I was, I was a coach's kid, so I just thought that, you know – Hugh Jackson was, is in his second year. He's going to be around here for a while. Sashi Brown is, you know, in the beginning of his tenure, he's going to be around here for a while. Like, I just – I need to do what the coaches want me to do. If, I, if This is going to be a long-term thing. You know, yeah. I'm going to be here for four or five years before we're great. But, you know, it's going to be some some struggling to, to get there. So, even at 0-14, I'm still, you know, good fake handoff, try to throw the ball on the outside mm -hmm. shoulder and, and, you know, make sure I try to not to turn the ball over. Do you think there's almost something that's like, you know, you're the hometown hero in Cleveland that – you kind of like want it so bad that you're almost like don't you're not just you know, like you just said you're just not playing loose you're like not being yourself like you almost like just want it to work out so bad that you're just like thinking way too much about it yeah you know yeah yeah, yeah. this is the sound clip by the way this yeah. is this gonna be this is gonna be the sound this, clip. Is this, 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 this is the, this is the thesis of that season <laughs> this is it right here I for the first time ever I was all ball yeah and up until that point. In high school sports, the harder I worked, the better we got. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to lock up on defense in basketball and I actually practiced hard on Sunday for that Tuesday game and played better defense, mm -hmm. we won. If I shot more shots and I was able to put up more buckets, we won. In yep. baseball, if I, if I actually stayed after and did extra BP and I knew that I was going to be able to drive someone in at the cleanup spot, like we, we got better as a team. So – as I got to to and same thing in, in in college football, you know, I start to compete with 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 Malik, and I start pushing. Now I get to the NFL, and I am working harder than I've ever worked in my life, and we're getting worse. Mm -hmm. And it was such a an absolute trip. I it, it hurt. It sucked. I I was losing who I was because I was trying to become Brett Favre. I was trying to become 
what every, you know, West Coast NFL coach wants you to be, and that is an all-ball guy. We don't mm-hmm. care about finances. We don't care about, you know, what you do in charity. We don't, we, you know, we might bring up your family and we might bring <laughs> up our faith because that's what we're supposed to talk about. But it, all that really matters is, like, can you come out and win us a game and lead this team and this organization and win a Super Bowl? So, like, I committed my whole life to just ball. I woke up at 4 in the morning. I got to the facility at 4.45. I read through that script to make sure that I can, you know, not go into a practice mid- midway through the season and mess up on, on calling a play in a huddle. That would be crazy embarrassing. Because I had issues with calling the plays and I was trying to get going, my quarterback coach would meet me at the facility at 6. Mm-hmm. We would literally throw live at 6 a.m., every throw from practice later in the day. So I knew where every ball was going to be, and I got one rep at it. Then we'd get off the field at 7.15. He would tell me to go watch film. I would actually go into the quarterback room and pretend like I was watching film, but I would take a nap from 7.15 until 8, until the team meeting because I'm exhausted. And I would go about our day, quarterback meeting, you know, unit meeting, team meeting, walk through practice, quarterback meeting. I would stay after make sure I was the last person in the building from, from that side because that's what they told me, you know, first one in, last one out, so make sure I'm the last one. Get done at 8 o'clock, get home, drive 20 minutes back to downtown Cleveland with my eyes almost shutting because I'm so tired, and I would go to sleep and wake up and do it again. But it wasn't working. We were still losing, and I was getting worse. Like, I was – honestly, I was getting worse. Once again, Pittsburgh, I was balling first, first game of the season. How am I putting more in? Somehow we aren't getting better. Like, what's going on here? So I thought – the, the, the answer to that was to, to give my all and, and then the game would give it back. But what I quickly realized after getting traded to Green Bay that following year and spending some time with who I think is one of the smartest quarterbacks to ever play the game, Aaron Rodgers, who is so well-rounded off the field, that that is completely false, that you don't have to give your all to the game. You just got to be you. And by being you, that's, what, that's where your greatness shines. And that's why Aaron is a Jeopardy – host and one of the smartest guys out there when it comes to history, conspiracies, business, finance, and and obviously football, that's what made him great. And at the time, I think that was probably my biggest limiting factor during my, you know, stint with the, with the Browns is that I was trying to be, you know, Andy Dalton on tape. That's, yeah. that's really what I was trying to be. <clears throat> Man, I got so many questions about that whole, that whole <laughs> process, and I appreciate you telling that, that story because I haven't heard that side of it before. Um, why do you think it was throughout that whole year that it – was there times when Hugh Jackson and the leadership of the Browns were, like, coming to you and saying, like, yo, like, just just be Deshaun Kaiser. Like, we drafted Deshaun Kaiser. Like, just be you. Was that ever a conversation or were they just – was it more like we want you there at 5 a.m. Like, you're not working hard enough. You know, what was the – what was the vibe like around? I mean, obviously, when you lose games, like the vibe's yeah. never good, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. You'd yeah. be surprised. The energy of that team, like you ask anybody who's on that team. More importantly, you ask anybody who played against that team that year. Yeah. Like we were good. We were actually a decent yeah. team. You know, like we had Christian Kirksey was balling. Now there were some weird things that happened at the beginning of the year. We we trade Joe Hayden. Uh-huh. Sorry. Yeah, we we trade Joe Hayden, and Demario Davis as well is now off the team. Those are two all pro defensive players. Mm-hmm. What? Why? What, what's the point? Like, why? Why is Joe Hayden? I don't know. We cut Joe Hayden. Sorry, we cut Joe Hayden and traded Demario Davis. What the heck? Like, why? What's the point of that? But um, other than things like that, like we we expected to win. Now we were a bunch of young cats. You had three starting first round players: Jabril yeah. Brett Perso- or Jabril and, David. My, and yeah. David on offense. Yeah. Um, and in David's room, the, the the next after David as a rookie, the most the next most experience was a second year, a couple second years guys, um, Seth DeValve and and uh, blanking on another one. Uh, but then in my room, same thing. Once we cut Brock Osweiler, it was me, Kevin Hogan, and Cody Kessler, mm-hmm. two two more two year guys. So. We don't know what winning looks like, but we're pretending like it. You know, we're still we're driving autobiographies, we're going to nice <laughs> dinners, and we're playing football on Sundays. That's what professional football is. But we didn't know what it, what work looked like. You know, yeah. we didn't we didn't really have that experience in our locker room. But so so in that team meetings, locker room energy, how we practice, like we still came back. You would expect that, like after zero and fourteen, that practices like come off dragon. Yeah, uh, we we are having a great time. We're still having team dinners and you know, we're we're still building camaraderie because we we believed in this vision that it was a long-term play. We believed that we were young. We believed that if we could just win the next 4 or win the next 3 or win the next 2 or just finish the season with a good win that ultimately it would stack up so that we can get over this hump and stop yeah. playing Cleveland football <clears throat> and ultimately be great. 
looking back on it, absolute shit show. <laughs> just absolute shit show. I mean, and just it just you know, from from a young quarterback trying to figure it out. You know, after after four or five weeks, I feel like I'm the smartest guy in the room from the quarterback position. So like, Cody and I are good friends, and we train in the off season. But like at the end of the day, like. I'm not, I'm not trusting in Cody's advice. Like he's trying to play and, and he's trying to get my job. And, and, yeah. and quite frankly, like you went one in 15 a year before, like, why would I listen to you? You know? So like I, I was on, I was on my own grind, you know, David Njoku, same thing with him. He was on his own grind. Miles yeah. Jabril, we, we all kind of, you know, we're on our own grind, but little, you know, we didn't know anything. We didn't know what we didn't know. And because, because of how that was set up. And, and then from there, you know, there's a lot of things you can get into why it was such a mess from the culture with the cars and, spending way too much money and, and pretending like we were something that we weren't. I mean, I went to Green Bay and there wasn't a Lambo in sight. And people were driving Tahoes and, and, and Grand <laughs> Cherokees. Like, what? This this is the great Green Bay. Like, what the heck? Um, but, uh, and then, you know, to the leadership, you know, you have Sashi Brown get fired halfway through. Um, you know, you have Hugh Jackson and Sashi who were clearly clashing that whole time. Um, you got, you know, Hasm family or, or the owners, you know, Changed my family's life. I, I I would love him forever for that. But you know, once again, get to Green Bay with no owner and play on a bunch of other teams, and never, never did you ever see the owners around that much. You yeah. know, so when you have Sashi and Hugh trying to figure it out, and then you have the owners, yeah, yeah the owners who are sitting in the room trying to figure it out with you. He, I'm I'm showing up to you know pra- or to work on on Tuesday to off day. Nobody's there, and freaking Jimmy sitting at the door. You know, getting ready to shake my hand and ask me about the game and what I thought about you know with play calling and stuff. And like that, that's the stuff that was like. Looking back on it's it, dysfunctional. Just, just <laughs> that. That's that's what was at the time. Like I can't speak for teams before that, and I can't speak for teams after that. I, I, I have some assumptions that maybe it was similar, but that my specific time there, like that was the that was the issue. Was that there was just there wasn't enough direction. Yeah. Like I think there was just so many small decisions that we could have made as an organization that would have just just changed things a little bit. Like. Let, let Brock stay. Brock and I yeah. had a great relationship. Like, we, we, we were literally paying him millions of dollars to go be a backup in Denver. Like, let, let him mentor me. Let me let me learn something, you know? Yeah. Get, get, a, get a veteran tied in in the room with David Njoku so that we can work together and, and know what that looks like and create some positive energy. Like, we had great leaders on the team that, that were all individuals, great players, but we just – just there was no – there was no – real direction there was no real experience that, that we could all believe in you yeah. know you, you get to the end of the year and you just you, you you're own 10 and you just don't even know who to believe this is why i think we could talk for like six hours because yeah. i again so many questions about this whole situation we were talking earlier today uh at the one of none office about uh i saw our boy max brown who was a big time quarterback posted something yeah. on tiktok about quarter call in in the nfl and also in college football quarterbacks like is so much can de- can be determined by where you go yeah. and like yeah. and his, his argument was that there's a scenario where Tom Brady goes somewhere bad and never becomes Tom Brady M- majority you know, yeah it's probably, probably so majority I want to ask you about that like there's so many so there's a scenario where you go to a different place and you play 20 years in the NFL and are a Hall of Fame quarterback like do you believe that and like how do you think I guess not the rag on Cleveland because you know we were talking about that, but like yeah. what what's your thoughts on like you know how much where you go dictates your success and and I know one of my really good friends Christian Ackenberg went yeah. to the Jets yeah. Yeah. at one of the worst times to go to the Jets. I think there's a scenario where Christian Ackenberg goes to Green Bay or to the Patriots and plays in the NFL for 15 years. Yeah, I think it's spot on. I think I think Max is is right. I think everyone will agree. Any anyone who's gotten drafted, you know, whether it's gone well or gone bad, they know that there was someone else that they were, could have ended up going and it would have been a completely different scenario. I think there's two things that I would add on to that concept. One is the round you're picked in, I think, especially as a quarterback. It's very interesting. If you look at the curve of the salary or of the signing bonus that you get, Mm -hmm. if you're anywhere from pick like, you know, 24 and in, they're giving you real money to come play football for them. You know, Miles Garrett was a first pick and got like, you know, 20 M's. Mm-hmm. If you're in those picks and you have a bad year, they've already invested so much money yeah. into you, they're going to keep you around. Yeah, they might they even fire, you. yeah, they <laughs> might even fire the head coach and find someone to work with you because yeah. they have so much money in you. If you're a second or third round quarterback, I think it's the toughest spot to be in mm-hmm. because if you don't do well that first year, Get they'll, rid of you. they'll cut yeah. you like you're a fourth or fifth round. But they're going to expect that they're going to expect you to be like a first rounder. 
Yeah. I showed up like I was one of the first like round guys holding, jer- yeah, yeah. holding jerseys and stuff mm-hmm. and getting the car service and stuff. Like, I'm supposed to be the next great thing as a second-round quarterback. So they would treat you like that, but then they just didn't have enough invested in you to, to really care what, you're, what yeah. they're going to do the next season. That's a good point. I never yeah. thought of that. So that, that's one thing. The, the second piece of it is purely the offense or defense you play in. Because I think that it's, it's you know, the draft classes between 20, let's call it 15 – up until, let's call it uh, 2020, mm-hmm. was a real transition in the NFL. Now, I, I know there's a lot of guys who know a lot more about football than I do, and they probably can have their own opinions, but I, I think that there was, this, there was this new opportunity for Pat Mahomes to come in and play his Texas, Texas Tech style of football and actually win a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. You, Andy Reid, you know, old-time coaches who are picking up from what, you know, uh, the Miami Dolphins did with the Wildcat what, you know, Colin Kaepernick was doing out in San Francisco and realizing that you can really win games playing this college style of ball, not going up there and pointing out the mic and and having a kill and an alert on every play. Yeah, Yeah, no, you can go out there and play fast, fake a handoff, turn around and throw a strike, you know, run zone read, all these things that that college teams are really doing, RPOs and all of that. So I think that in that time, there was a lot of opportunity for a guy like Max Brown – to end up in a West Coast offense that might have better suited him. So he could go out there and point the mic, but now all of a sudden he has to get, you know, he has to go and compete yeah. against a guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, who has to, who has a young guy yeah. behind him or, or another, you know, athletic guy who's running RPOs. Um, so, so I think that during that time where you got drafted and what that head coach was trying to – or that offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator was trying to run definitely had a, had a big, play, a, a big yeah. you know, uh, uh, say in how you ended up yeah. you know, finishing out your career. The trade to Green Bay, how did that go down? Um, I'm out in – so we, we brought in uh, a new GM at the end of that season and uh, didn't really vibe with them too crazy. You know, I didn't, Who was it? Um, There's been so many in Cleveland. <laughs> Doesn't came matter. From, came yeah. from Kansas City. This is so bad. I mean, wow. This yeah, is really but there bad. have been like 20 he looked GMs. looked it up for me just so, <laughs> so I can get the guy's name. I'm blanking. He was at Kansas City before that. He came to us. He ended up getting fired. He was a ball guy, though. Like, that was the exact opposite of Sashi. Sashi came in with stats and analytics and yeah. Harvard grad. This dude was a ball guy. He didn't care about nothing else. That's why he drafted Baker. You know, like, that, <laughs> that tells you everything. Like, that, that's that's what he wanted in his quarterback job. He, did, he didn't want a Notre Dame guy. He wanted mm-hmm. Baker. Um, but we uh, – so I'm out I'm – out, Dorsey. Gosh, oh, Ken that. Dorsey. Yeah, Dorsey. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, so I'm out in San, or I'm out in, uh, in Huntington Beach enjoying my first ever off season. I got a little money in my pocket, having a good time, you know, trying to trying to get rid of that 0-16 and, and, and just and, and get better, ultimately get better. And, and do you have any inclination that they're going to trade you? Like are you um, thinking like maybe this isn't going to work out in Cleveland? Yeah, yeah, no. Once again, I don't have a good relationship with Dorsey, but yeah. like but you could you could you could slice up our team however you want to slice it. Like you could just take these 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 young first round and me and, and yeah. build around that you can go draft other guys you can go get the next top you know we had plenty of salary cap you know that that yeah. that whole situation in Cleveland I I strongly believe if you make that decision with Joe Hayden and Demario Davis at the beginning of that year you let Brock Osweiler go what you're doing is you're opening up salary cap space to go yeah. spend that True. the following year so you can go spend that on Aaron Rodgers if Aaron Rodgers wants to leave you can really go spend that on a real quarterback so I have no idea what's going to happen but I didn't hear anything for a long time so I, I assumed that I was actually going to end up going back so I get a call randomly from from Dorsey. I'm on my way home from a workout, driving down to PCH, pulling up onto the peninsula in Newport. He, you know, he's asking me about, you know, telling me how much he loves Newport Beach. You know, how's your family doing? How you throwing the football? Are you getting in shape, man? And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Um, so conversation. I, I honestly, I answer the call and get nervous. I think I'm getting ready to get traded. Now I'm talking for 35 great, great minutes. Talk. Like, yeah, great talk. This is great. I'm in Cleveland. This is dope. I'm going back. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, "Oh yeah, by the way, Deshaun." Uh, we're going to ship you up to Green Bay. We think it's the best thing for you. You know, it's, it's, it's a good direction for us. I think we're going to draft a guy in this class. We're shipping you to Green Bay. Shipping me to Green Bay. What the heck does that mean? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting shipped to Green Bay. Imagine okay, cool. being less humanized than, like, shipping exactly. you to Green Bay. Gosh. So, I, go, I end up going back. I get back, to New, or I get back to my spot in Newport and get a call from Green Bay, and they're all excited. I go up there and, and do my little visit. See how, how much Green Bay was in the middle of nowhere, but, like, really was, like, this is the best thing that could possibly happen. I thought, yeah. like, 
after going 0-16, if there was if there was anything that I can ask for, send me behind a great quarterback so I can learn and figure out what being an NFL quarterback actually is. And quite frankly, I watch Aaron. I was watching Aaron Rodgers tape more than I was watching my own tape that that year before. This is sick. I get to go learn from a great. Um, so I was really excited about that, and actually had a great time that evening, knowing that I was getting out of Cleveland. I can get a, a good reset with a, with a good team. Um, so I was actually, you know, pretty excited. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know. What, I didn't know what that entailed. I didn't know that you know what what moving a whole house from Cleveland up to Green Bay entailed, and and changing all my taxes and and all of that stuff. That like it, that was that sucks. That starts. That's when you start to really realize does, the business of this. Does NFL. Green Bay do it all for you, or you gotta like? That one, yes. Yeah. yeah, that one being being a you know, I got traded for a first rounder, so that was like a marquee trade. They they send it, they you know, they cover ten thousand dollars worth of shipping. They they cover you know, they move all your got stuff it. for you. So that was actually a pretty seamless move for me. Yeah. First time you met Aaron Rodgers, what was that like? It's cool. It was cool. It was you know, he's he's a he's a wise dude. So like he, it was yeah. a it was like a you know, what's up, young buck kind of thing. And then it was, you know, we had met before because he's a part of Athletes First. He's a sign of Dave Dunn. So we had met before at the Athletes First class before. So we knew who each other were. Um, you know, he obviously had a, a, a bit of a, a rep of how, do, how does he treat his backups, you know. Um, but I knew he had a really good uh, relationship with Taysom Hill and, and um, uh, with Matt Flynn. So I, I, I knew that if, as long as you became cool with him, I know we operate the same way. We hang out in the same circles. We, we should have a, a good relationship from a starter and a backup. Yeah. So then how was that relate? Like w- when he was a starter that whole year, you know, did you learn a lot? Were you, how involved were you? Like what was, what was that year like for you? It was the, it was the, it was a really important year in my life. Yeah. Really, really important year in my life. So first off I get to the facility, you know, I, I shook hands with him in the, in the cafeteria a little while back, but then get to the facility first day of practice. We get into the quarterback room. I'm nervous. I don't know what this is like. You know, this guy's the GOAT. This offense is a real West Coast offense. Like, there's a lot of responsibility. You know, I'm trying to be real studious. You know, you know how it is first day. First yeah, yeah, day, yeah. You, got, you got 12 <laughs> highlighters for no reason. You got three <laughs> different types of pens, like a setup, get my station right, walk in. Aaron looks right at me and says, Mm-mm. fuck, all right, pick the wrong seat. Pick all my stuff up, move it over. Things are great. Cool. I'm going to get set up here. Uh, shut the door. And... The first thing that Aaron Roger that comes out of Aaron Rodgers' mouth was, "Do you believe in 9/11?" <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Do I believe in 9/11? Yeah, I mean, why why wouldn't I? He was like, "You should read up on that." <laughs> should read up on that. Okay, <laughs> now we start learning about the playbook and stuff. I'm like, wow, like I don't know where this yeah. is going. But what, what it ended up being was just like a, a real thought experiment where he wanted me to go back and you know, look into some of the conspiracies around it and provoke a lot of great conversation. And we really bonded over that. And you know, we started sharing some books and talking about some other things and got into history and business and finance. But ultimately, the reason why that was such a great year for me personally it was that I realized that this guy – in my opinion, is the best thrower of the football of all time. He spins the ball better than anyone else. I've never seen the ball jump out of a guy's hand. I don't. There's something in the elbow and the wrist that just makes the ball kind of have a little more velocity yeah. than anyone else. And he is a, a a genius when it comes to football. He remembers every play. He he remembers every defense, and he is like a, a true you know uh, footballer. Like he, he loves the game. He loves to compete. He's out there playing against the defensive coordinator. He's not playing against you. I know you're trying to talk crap. He doesn't care. He's playing against your defensive coordinator. That's why when he throws a touchdown, he doesn't look at the defense. He looks at the defensive coordinator. Yeah, because yeah. that, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the, the level of the game he's playing. But he's also getting off the field, and we're spending half of our QB conversation talking about the Federal Reserve. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, you know, business and investing and, and history and all in jeopardy and, and, yeah. and, and, and uh, art and, and movies. And he's just so knowledgeable of all these other things. And it made me realize like I had it all wrong in Cleveland. Yeah. Like I, that I you thought that both. I had to be all ball. I thought yeah. that, that was what you're supposed to be. And I realized that no, the, what makes Aaron Aaron, what makes him great is the fact that he pushes his mind to places that no other quarterback will ever go because he, he respects the game for what it is, and he loves the game for what it is. But when he turns off that switch, he is trying to push himself off the field just as much as he does on the field. And, that, and that's what gives him that competitive edge. That's what allows him to remember 
the third down play heading into the south end zone against the Chicago Bears in which the DB played like this. So I checked to that, and now, you know, it's now five years later, and I'm going back to that same play knowing it's going to work, throw the touchdown, look over. Everyone's saying, what the hell? What play was that? And he comes over and tells you, yeah, go check that out on film. You pull it up, and lo and behold, there it is, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's because of the things that he does off the field. It's because he's such a, an intellect, and it's because he's so smart. I think that's what makes him great, and it showed me that, like, yo, I might be able to do something like that. What were some of the other favorite topics in the QB room? The Federal Reserve, artwork. <laughs> Do you have any Talk other conspiracy that. theories? Talked about some shit. Uh, <laughs> inner Earth, <laughs> moon landing, the moon. Oh, he's probably he's, he's probably uh, got some crazy theories on the uh, moon. Reptile landing. people. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are laughing. <laughs> Go do your research. Yeah. I'm telling you. Go do your research. <laughs> yeah, I might have to take you guys to Agartha. <laughs> I'm telling you. Do your research. You guys are laughing. This isn't. It, it sounds like jokes, but like I'm. I'm. I'm do your research. <laughs> Just do your do, research. Do you ever wish that you would have went the Green Bay right out of college? Like 100%. you think that would have changed your? That changed everything. Yeah, that would change everything. Because because another another issue with me is that stereotypes aside. If you have the, if you're a potential, if you're a guy that you're getting drafted off of potential, mm-hmm. off of athletic ability, off of the, if you can connect the 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 smart pat stuff from business in Notre Dame to the 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 athletic ability that you saw through high school playing multiple sports, then maybe you could be this like next kind of like yeah. superstar, you know. So I never was evaluated as just being a backup or a support player. It was like, if you're going to bring me in, it's because Aaron Rodgers is getting old. We need to compete, and we want somebody who might be athletic. If you're going to send me over to Green – or if you're going to, you know, from there, get cut from there and head over to Oakland, mm-hmm. you're picking me up because, you know, they, they're trying to win a Super Bowl and, and they, they are considering trying to play a little more electric football and, and move the ball a little bit. So come sit here behind Derek, and when we move over to Vegas, we're going to try to play a new style of ball. It was never like – Come here and support. Yeah, and I, and I thought that that was probably going to be my best role. It's like I I I, yeah. I I can pick up offenses. I can, I can study with like the best of them. I can you know come in and and you know try to play smart ball. I can be athletic if you need me to. If you have a Deshaun Watson or a Kyler Murray or a Pat Mahomes, so I can go do that style of offense. But I can also point out the mic and get us in the right play, just like yeah. anyone else. Let me just be a backup. After I got out of Cleveland, like, I just want to be a good backup for now, and then we can worry about, you know, getting back on top later down the road. But, unfortunately, I dug myself into a hole being 0-16, turning the ball over a lot. My film wasn't great from that. And then, also, I just was never considered to be a backup. Yeah. Every situation I was in was come here to beat out this guy. Yeah. You know, so so that, that I think, set me back. If I get drafted to Green Bay – or 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 yeah, New England, yeah. you're a backup, and yeah. you're going to be a backup for three three or four years. So you can learn over time and have a couple good preseason that you put yeah. together, and then ultimately, you know, get out on the field and bring this full circle back to the, you know the Max Brown comment of if you're in the right situation, you yeah. know, who knows where your career can go. Take me through the rest of your NFL time. Then you get cut from the Packers, right? Is yeah. that what happened? Yeah. And then was the next year COVID year? Yeah. 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 No. 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 A year after that. So so I go to I get traded to the Packers. Uh, Mike McCarthy's the head coach there. I got a great relationship with Mike McCarthy. Love Mike McCarthy. Brilliant football mind. Just a, a just a true baller. You know, just you know, a Bill Walsh disciple. True, uh, uh, you know, true West Coast guy under under that under that Bill Walsh tree, um, and love being there with him. But unfortunately, he got he got fired right fired during that season. So yeah. now all of a sudden, I'm going to that next season. Who's going to be the head coach? Oh. Matt LaFleur, oh, yeah. quarterback yeah. coach from Notre Dame. Yeah. Same guy who told me I should play tight end. This should be interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's going to go well. Yeah, that's going to go all right. <laughs> but, it, but it did, though. So I'm, I'm talking to Matt before he even, even gets hired, and, and you know he's trying to get the lowdown on the team and trying to learn about Aaron. Everyone knew that I had a good relationship with Aaron at the time, so he was trying to get some information about it, you know if it, how can he you know, get this job. And um, so that that off season, I'm expecting to be the backup. You know, Matt and I are having conversations about like, all right, you know, we're going to learn behind Aaron and you know, I'm gonna end up taking this thing over. You know, Aaron's getting to the back end of his career, so I got treated like a backup, like a like the number two. Now Tim Boyle, this undrafted guy, comes in and he's a gunslinger. He can he can rip it. But you know, I'm I got traded for a first rounder. Like I'm I'm gonna be here. Um, I backed up the year before. I did. I had a couple outings. You know, we played against Chicago. I came in. End up uh, Cleo Mack end up embarrassing me uh, before the half. You know, end up strip sack. Uh, then all, yeah, just bad. Just, Bad stuff happened. Um, 
yeah, to throw a pick to uh, throw a pick to him on the screen as well, just ugly. Um, but then at the end of the year, get back in against the Lions, had a couple good plays, a couple bad plays, but I, I still plan on being the guy when Matt LaFleur gets there um, until, like, preseason game two and three. And I was already in, in preseason game two. I go out with the starters and actually play well against Baltimore, but we get done with the game, and, and uh, Tim Boyle has a great um, third and fourth quarter. So now we go into preseason game three, and they're like, hey, you know, the, or Matt comes up to me like, I don't know what this means, but, like, it's going to be all right. Uh, but the GM wants to see a little more Tim. They want to see Tim play. Like, he's been playing well. I'm like, all right, cool. What does that mean? He was like, well, you guys are going to split. You're going to split reps. Um, with the twos. With the twos. Yeah. No, yeah, with the twos. With the twos. Yeah. Um, but then the preseason game four comes around, and I'm thinking to myself, I already got this thing in the bag. I have two good – I have three good preseason games before that. Um, and But then they say Tim's going to start, and you're going to play in the second half. And I was like, oh, shit, this is a real competition. Mm. Like, I really got to go out there and ball, but I'm going out there in preseason four. And if you know anything about preseason four, like, you're out there in the third and fourth quarter with guys who are just hanging on by a thread. Yeah. You're going out they there ain't making guys, the team. They're not <laughs> making the team. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm trying to save my career with guys who are yeah. not making the team so that I play okay, end up throwing a couple bad balls, and ultimately get released. They go with Tim Boyle. You know, Tim Boyle ends up being the backup. I go to the or I go to waivers. Uh, I'm not thinking I'm going to get uh, claimed off waivers. I actually make the decision to go to Buffalo, New York. I was going to go be a backup there. I love what they're building out there. They had a really clear mission. I like Josh Allen. This is that exact scenario. Now I can actually yeah. get you know evaluated to be a a, a true backup there um, rather than a starter. Um, uh, but the, the Raiders end up claiming me off ra- waivers, and I go out there and. Pretty much kick it throughout that next year. You know, I got there at game one. That offense is really intricate. Um, he tells me this is a Vegas thing, and so I'm, I'm just going to learn the offense. End up uh, having some great practices, and actually earned the backup job for the last couple of weeks there. Um, I did have a hiccup though. It was a new play that I put into the playbook, and on the first game that I got named the backup. And I shouldn't share this story too much, but. He, John Gruden goes like, what's this new play? It was called Charger. We're playing against the Chargers. Chargers play a, s- a specific style of, of cover three mm-hmm. where they carry the tight end. They, they uh, shade the safety over and cover three to the, the, to the, uh, the speed, and they run uh, you know, true drop zone coverage against the speed and carry the other side. So we had a couple of plays in the red zone that were called San Diego and Charger and like specifically put in to beat that defense. Yeah. He, he says, what's Charger? And I – I had no idea. And this is the day before the game. So that kind of hurt me in that scenario. Um, so then that next offseason, that's sitting in the back of his mind. We, we go to get Marcus Mariota. I still think I'm going to be the backup. I think Marcus Mariota might be the starter. I'm going to be the backup. Quarantine hits. John Gruden's offense is crazy hard. Um, uh, Nate Peterman is, has been a guy there who knew the offense quite well. Uh, Mariota's getting paid 10 M's. Uh, Derek Carr's getting paid 25 was enough room for, for me, so I ended up getting released um, and started thinking about one of none and, 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 and what could potentially happen after football because now it's three years, three teams, three head coaches. Yeah, it's it's going to be hard to get out of this. You know, the odds yeah. are against me. So then that fourth year, are you, are you on a team that fourth year? during Then the fourth year is COVID, right? Fourth year is COVID. Yeah. So now there's no movement in free agency. Yeah. I can't get a workout. I can't get a call. I can't hop on a plane. Like, just chill out. We don't even know if we're having a season this year. So that's where that's where I decided to open up my, my business journal and, and start thinking about one of none. But I did end up, at the beginning of that year, Marcus Mariota goes to IR, Vegas calls. I, we want you to just come in for the first six weeks yeah. and while Marcus is out. So I go out there and I, I, I go P-Squad for the first six weeks there, get released when Marcus comes back, um, uh, go back to California for a couple weeks, um, and then Drew Locke, and the whole Denver Broncos team, our, our quarterback room gets COVID. Now everyone freaks the hell out because they just saw uh, Blake Bortles have to get brought in off the streets to be able to play in the game yeah. because COVID is so contagious. So everyone tries to get this quarantine quarterback position. Tennessee calls me for a workout. I'm in great shape. I throw the ball really well. And they signed me to be the quarantine quarterback, which essentially means that I was going to stay at a hotel, zoom into every meeting, not be a part of any of the actual team <laughs> stuff to be away from the quarterback, show up after practice, throw the P squad guys, get back to the hotel, stay away from everyone. So it ended up being awesome for me because I was starting one of none. Yeah. I was actually, you know, zoom into the meeting, yeah. get done, they go to practice. I call it Pat. We start putting together whatever slide deck or whatever figma I needed to do for that. And then uh, head over to practice, throw real well. Great. Team goes on the way trip. 
I'm chilling. I'm still kind of building one of none on the side of that, but but still playing pretty well. You know, still think there might be a shot for me to play. So okay, so I, I think now's the time we start diving into the entrepreneurial perfect, journey. Perfect, perfect, uh, perfect. About two hours in, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I'm well, not sure where we're at here, but uh, oh, shit. if you're still listening uh, yeah. at this point, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, think still gonna, I think people are still. I think I think people are still gonna be listening. Are we good on on cameras and audio and stuff, or do we need to take a break? Yeah, we can go. We're on. Okay, so during that COVID year, when yeah. you're on. When you're on, when you're the quarantine quarterback, yep. so that must have been a, that might have been the best gig in the world. It was the best. I don't even want to know what your weekly paycheck was to be the quarantine quarterback, but it was probably good. pretty good. nice. It was good. Um, it was good. I miss it. So yes. when did I mean? Again, a lot of questions I had that we've skipped over in the sake of time. You out of uh, when you were in the draft process got signed to the Jordan brand, yeah. right? And yeah. were you the first quarterback that Jordan brand signed that? Was it that year? Like, I was, because I know that has a big, that had a big part in where one of none came about in your business, the business now. So yeah. t- talk me through that process. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, there was, there was a guy at, at uh, Jordan brand who was from Toledo who knew my dad and grew up in the same neighborhood I did. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I was making a decision, um, in the pre-draft process on, on Nike or Adidas as typically the, you know, the main decision to make there, um, I wanted to do something different, you know, so I, I called Brand Jordan. I knew they were taking a couple rookies at, at that time, and I called the guy that I knew from from my hometown and actually went out to the Super Bowl and met with him and just pitched myself, you know, like, mm-hmm. like I want to be a part of the brand. This is who I am. You know, we have the same roots. We have the same mission um, and ultimately convinced him to sign me, and that was a bold move for him because I was, you know, it wasn't a sure thing first rounder. This brand is prestigious. Only top guys were that brand. It's a privilege to be a part of that brand. Because all the benefits that come with being a part of that brand are better than any cash that any other brand can give you. Just being in that family with MJ, obviously all the greats in the basketball court, on the baseball diamond, out, out, um, you know, golfing. There's dancers. It's the, it's the best of the best across every sport that that MJ handpicks to be a part of the family. So for me to get tapped to do that, that was that was big time for me. Um, and I use my my experience there really as an opportunity to just learn about brand you know i'm still this business guy so so they had this board of governors meeting every year where they bring on the athletes together and all the executives um, and we sit down and we do these little workshops about marketing and and kind of forecasting out any new products that would come out um, but you know a lot of team building uh, you know uh, you know some working out some golf uh, but at, at a cool destination location so we went to cabo we we're supposed to go to aspen um, ended up in monaco one year um, but that really became a, 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 a really cool opportunity for me to really dive into business within sports. You know, how can yeah. I kind of leverage my network to, to then take Notre Dame, my learnings from Notre Dame alongside, you know, sports and see if there's some way to tie it together to become a thesis that I could turn into a dope business. So then that COVID year, how does the idea of starting the business that is – in place now today we're in the vault of one and none of yep. one of none and all the artworks on the wall how did that idea start that covid year or was it before the covid year that you had the yeah, idea so, so so the 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 beginning of the idea uh was in monaco uh we went to um uh, monte carlo monaco we're staying at the hotel de paris right downtown it had beautiful to be lit spot. oh my <laughs> gosh it was incredible it was the most beautiful place i've ever been um, and and during our, our team sessions, our marketing sessions, you know, the, the, the sessions that are about the brand, the two topics that we discussed were, or the two shoes that we were discussing were the upcoming Travis Scott drop, mm-hmm. which everyone knows, ended up being one of the highest demanded shoes of all time, um, and also the Dior drop. And that was like, holy crap, you know, high-end luxury brand. Now is collabing with MJ. This is, this is as big as it gets. You know, Jordan to date has been a streetwear brand, obviously right around – um, you know, this American basketball culture. And now all of a sudden yeah. you're, you're at Paris fashion week with Dior. The brand is getting ready to go global. It is global, but now it's getting ready to take this big step. But one of the common themes between those two meetings was this concept of driving demand through scarcity. You know, these limited edition drops, how many do we drop? Why do we drop them? What story are we trying to tell? Mm-hmm. Ultimately things that would make this, this, this sneaker collectible. But one thing I couldn't wrap my head around during that time was like, why would you ever create a limited edition drop where it's going to create value in a market that you don't play in? You know, that's the secondary market. Um, 
Instead, you have StockX and Goat and eBay and the consignment store and my shoe plug. All these dudes are making crazy money off of you in a secondary market. But we as a brand, the only thing we got to get out of this is brand equity. And, and I think that that's great. Yeah. I think that concept is awesome. And, and by secondary market, for people following along, you mean the – the Jordan makes money off the initial sale on their website. And then after that, people may resell them, but the brand Jordan doesn't see any money from exactly, that. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Instead is this is a peer to peer win. You know, yeah. I go buy the sneaker for 170, I buy the Travis Scott low for 175 bucks. I go on StockX literally five minutes later and sell yeah. it for $5,000. I make the money on that. That five thousand dollars that just happened, all that revenue, all that hype that we're creating around that sneaker is now on the on the resale to the to the collector and the brand originally. Not the drop. Get, exactly. Yeah. They get they get no access to that. Um, so the the response, I asked David Creech, who's the creative director at the time, and um, has become a good friend and now is a, is an advisor on one of none. Um, you know, we've chatted we chatted about it and and the the answer he gave me was brand equity, and and I and I and I vibe with. It. I thought that made mm. a lot of sense. You know, you go out there, you create all this demand, have or you know, the small percentage gets their hands on them. They're hyped. The rest of the people don't get their hands on them. They're jealous. Next shoe comes out, they're gonna stand right back in that line and try to get this one. You know, this culture of like trying to get your hands on them is like, you know, that 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 is that is more valuable than than anything that you can get in the secondary market. That was a, that was a response I got from from DC. Uh, but I didn't think that was enough because if you could take 5% of the $27 million that it did on, on StockX in the secondary market, you might be able to buy yourself a Super Bowl commercial for that brand equity. Yeah. Like that, you can do some real stuff with that amount of money. So I, I you know, I, I kind of double circled that and kept that in the back of my mind. So when quarantine comes around and I'm trying to figure out three or, you know, four teams or three teams, three, t three years at the time, no movement in the free agency. What am I, what can I do off the field? I'm now inspired by Aaron Rodgers and in, in, in the in the Silicon Valley as I was up in Oakland the year before of like really trying to get a business going. Um, that was the idea I decided to lean into. So I, I was one of the bold people who hopped on a flight in the middle of quarantine when they say you weren't supposed to fly, and I went back home and went into my parents. Uh, it's called we call it the pond house, but it's like a, a really a garage in the backyard that that uh, Tommy actually um, and my my parents and I went in and started to put the to uh, start to put together a little like. Um, shack for me to be out there and work and I sat out there for three or four days and I started leaning into this idea how can I help limited edition creators so brands artists uh, uh, athletes entertainers musicians people who can create really dope physical goods that have value in the secondary market how can I help them access some of that resale um, and and knew that it was a big market call all of my, a lot of my smartest friends my boy JP, who was running this tech uh, startup at the time, he was like, yeah, he was the one who started talking about the phrase secondary market. I'm like, yeah, JP, smart, I'm going to use that secondary <laughs> market. I call Pat now. Pat, I got this business that's going to help creators get into the secondary market. Pat's like, yeah, that's cool, but, like, I don't know anything about that. Like, I don't know anything about Supreme yeah. or Off-White. All these brands that you're mentioning, I don't know anything about that. Like, but then I told Pat, but, like, think about it from this. What about, what about the up-and-coming artists in Buffalo? This person is, is getting ready to take off. We know for a fact that that he that they're selling pieces. They were selling for five hundred bucks last year. Now all of a sudden they're five thousand bucks. It's going up to seventy five hundred this summer. They are on track to be the next you know person who can sell a piece for thirty thousand dollars. But here's the catch, Pat. In five years, those pieces from the original, you know, those originals yeah. from four or five years ago that someone bought for five thousand dollars, those are the ones that have the most value. Those are the ones that while everything else at, at the initial sale is selling at fifty, mm -hmm. it's selling at a hundred because it's one of those originals from back in the day. That artist doesn't get any access to that. But that's an up and coming artist in Buffalo. Yeah. They they would want access to that money. I know Jordan might not want it. That might just be drops in a bucket to the bigger grand scheme. But like here's a starving artist that would love to have five percent of that resale royalty if they could. Pat was like, all right. I get that. That that's what we can build. I, I I understand that. So we, uh, after you know, spending a couple months, you know, trying to hash out a couple ideas. He was moonlighting. It. He had another job. Obviously, I was you know still training for ball. We finally got came up with this concept of, of a social marketplace that you know you could do the primary sale as well as the secondary sale, and we're off to the races of building what we were calling at the time one of none. What was the decision to kind of end your? I mean, not kind of. You ended your football career to go all in on one of none. And do you think, could you have kept it going at that point? Like, were there other opportunities and were you kind of like, this idea is so big that it's not worth going team to team anymore in the NFL? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, um, 
that was that was you know we started we started thinking about one of none and actually got the LLC. We we put the cart before the horse. We had the brand, the LLC, the logo, <laughs> the slide deck, all of that in May of 2020. So this okay. is this is over two years of a build. Yeah. Um, that that version of one of none was all Web two. We didn't know anything about blockchain. We really didn't know anything about tech. We had to call Pat's older brother for advice. Eventually, convinced his older brother, hey, you should be a co-founder and help us build this thing. And by you Web two, you it. mean like. Normal internet that yeah, we're all normal, used to. Yeah, yeah. No, normal internet. Just for people who don't know what yeah, Web2 means. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course, of course. So we're yeah. thinking like, you know, our idea was you have StockX and then you have, you know, Kith. Mm-hmm. Kith does these curated drops in the primary market. After they drop, they then go over to StockX. Can we just connect the two? Can we, can we create a curated marketplace that finds dope limited edition products, but then use social profiles as a way to track those products and track yeah. their owners, you know, so which allows Kith to then get money on the secondary transactions. On the secondary, yeah. because yeah. through those social profiles and tracking that ownership, you now create this ledger of ownership. And then ultimately you try to do whatever you can to keep that collector excited to stay on your platform. So rather than going to stock extra goat or eBay or the local shoe plug to sell them in the secondary market, they just sell on the same marketplace yeah. that they initially bought the product. Um, Hopefully you capture a percentage of those resales. You know, you're still going to lose some to StockX, but you capture a percentage of those yeah. and then you take a royalty off of that and kick it back to the original owner or the original creator. And here you have this ecosystem that that's kind of tracking these products on, you know, um, ongoing. Um, so that we, we really try to hash it out. We get, we really don't really come up with the real idea and understand how it's really going to be built that, that initial idea at least until the football season. So um, you know, I'm kind of, that's when I was doing the whole quarantine QB thing. I'm out in Vegas knowing I'm going to get cut soon. So I'm still taking meetings for one of none and trying to figure that out. Um, but you know, we get halfway through that year and I start talking to Pat and you know, once again, we brought on his older brother, Mike, um, who's also a Notre Dame guy, um, who's our full stack engineer. And I'm like, look, we're going to continue to, to think about this and conceptualize it, but come the end of this season, we have an off season worth of a sprint to get this thing as far as we can, because I'm telling you guys, this thing is big enough that if we can get this thing off the ground before next season, I'm, I'm done. This is, this is it. This is, this is everything I've ever learned. This is everything I ever loved. This is my dad's classic car collection, meeting my, my sneaker collection, meeting my relationships with influencers and, and entertainers and athletes, meeting my business knowledge and, this whole big trend in business school at the time of, of, of you know, the, the, the new social um, e-commerce world, this peer-to-peer stuff, this Uber, the Uber of this, you know, like yeah. this is everything that I've been taught brought to one dope idea that nobody has. And, and I'm watching StockX grow to be a multi-billion dollar business. Like there's plenty of space for us to go do this with. Like, this is great. Uh, so January comes up and I call Pat up. Hey, Pat, I do my off seasons in Newport Beach. You got to come with me out to Newport Beach. I got to show you this lifestyle I live out there. It's dope. Pat's like, look, man, I got 17 birthdays that I have to attend between now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Little did everybody know, Pat has a birthday freaking every weekend that he has to go back to Jersey for. He leaves Nashville for. I got these 17 birthdays. But other than those weekends, yeah, I'll come out to Newport Beach. I was like, dope. Come on out. Um, so Pat, Pat comes and lives uh, uh, with my girlfriend and I out there at the time, and, and we start building. And we were like, all right, here we go, dead sprint, right towards, towards a launch before um, that next, that upcoming season. And after about a month of being out there, maybe three weeks of being out there, we start hearing this buzz about blockchain. No, no, we, we're, we're smart enough to know that if you're going to build a business, you got to put as many buzzwords in the mission statement as possible. So we had blockchain in our mission statement. We're like, we're tracking these things through blockchain. We didn't even know what blockchain really, how it works. <laughs> like it was just, we just knew if you put blockchain in there and you put, it you know, cool. and you put, yeah. yeah, you put the word yeah. leverage about 12 yeah. times in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, you'll find a way to, to, to get some sort of VC to be excited about you. But so we had blockchain in the mission, but didn't really know how we're going to implement it. We said, this is going to be a three year plan. Three years from now, we're going to implement blockchain because that's when blockchain is going to figure itself out. Well, three years became three months when NBA Top Shot started to take off. Now, every one of my business podcasts I'm li- listening to are talking about NFTs and crypto and blockchain and all these other things. Um, so I, I was like, all right, we got to look we got to look back into this. And then there was a golf, a golf event that we had or a golf day that we had with this guy, Tyler Henry, who runs a company called Sturdy Co. Um, out of Hollywood. And he said, yeah, we're, we're into these NFTs as well. We're going to start this thing called Sturdy Exchange. We're going to do digitals. And we're like, shoot, Tyler's doing this. Everything else is saying do, that they're doing this. We got to implement this right now. We haven't even launched yet. We're just starting to build. 
I know Mike is going to kill us that we're going to come up with this whole new idea that he has to learn yeah. in blockchain, but like we got to, we got to yeah. go figure out how to use blockchain. So um, came back, got on the big whiteboard and we hashed it out. How do we use NFTs? And we're like, all right, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to take every, every physical product we launch and we're going to connect it to an NFT so that you can have this ability to exchange your ownership on our platform, but then also have the physical good as well. So now you get the best of both worlds, perfect, innovative, you know, blockchain, every, this is great, great idea, but we had no idea how we're going to do it. We don't really know anything about blockchain. We don't know anything about authentication. Everything we're doing before that was supposed to be peer to peer. Now we have to have the central mechanism of somehow authenticating the goods. Um, But we just knew that, you know, we're just going to go pitch people saying we're going to put them in one-to-one relationships. Man, there's we could talk about one of none for like six days too. Right? No, 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 <laughs> we no, we no, can no, make no, they can make this a long podcast. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I got no, I got no, to get my sound bites. It's me. No, it's little. me. I got like seventy two questions going through my mind right now. And uh, you know, I, so what was the point where you said I'm? It, it was it after the Web three when you said I'm done playing football? That's right. That was the question you asked yeah. last time. Yeah. I just went on this long. No, story it was great. Even asked the no, it was great. Yeah. That's, uh, that's on me. I, that's on me. Coach. No, you're good. Um, so, so <laughs> it's all good. It's all yeah. Good. <laughs> so, so we sprint and we try to build and we build and we build and now we're implementing blockchain. So things are starting to take a little bit longer because it's like we're not just doing the code that Mike was already using. He has yeah. to go learn new ways to take his old databases and think about the blockchain and how we're going to implement this and implement that and then. Okay, now you know we have to have some sort of a vault that's going to keep good storage of these goods so that um, we can have these these uh, NFTs out there. And then, well, how are we going to authenticate it when it wants to come back to the vault? Well, let's look into RFID technology. We go off on this RFID tangent for a couple of weeks and try to learn how to do that. We're just doing a whole bunch, but learning and, and really coming up with thoughtful ways to connect the physical and the digital. But it took what we thought was going to be like a – you know, a four or five month build before that season started. So I can make a decision before training camp started, ended up getting leaked into training camp. So now I got to go. I, I can't, I just, I don't know if it's there just yet. We're getting good feedback, but it doesn't exist yet. You know, the build isn't where we want it to be just yet to be able to make a real decision. So I got to go play football, go back out to Tennessee. I was signed to Tennessee. I got signed back after the, being a quarantine QB. And um, Pat comes out there pretty much with me for the most of my time in Tennessee. And this is this is 2021. This is uh, 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we come out to Tennessee. We're doing training camp, uh, or we, we do a summer, or we do a spring OTAs, and now we're we're still building one of none through OTAs, and I'm still trying to sprint as hard as I can up to training camp. But now we get to training camp, and we are like just close enough to start calling VCs and raising money and then really starting to get this business really off the ground. Mike is starting to build a bit of a prototype of some things. We got some vision. We got some things that we can show people some demos, some real cool concepts. So we, um, we, uh, we get to training camp and now I'm, I'm literally for the first time ever on the phone with VCs and getting ready for my first yeah. ever venture capital meetings. Never knew anything about venture capital as training camp is starting. So I'm on the off days getting done with practice at eight o'clock at night, calling Pat from like nine till 1030 to try to figure out if we can get a call in the books with a VC mm-hmm. for the next off day that I'm thinking is going to be next Wednesday. <laughs> but like, I don't know, you know, coach Ray will move it. So like, let's try to put it on Wednesday and I'm like trying to do both. Um, but really loving one of none, really loving business, really finding, really feeling like myself during that time. Um, but, but to be honest with the AB and I haven't really said it publicly, I just, my mind wasn't in football. My mind was on business. You know, I was, I was, you know, in, in offensive meetings and rather than drawing up tomorrow's plays like I used to, I was drawing up, you know, UIs for, for the new collector profile or yeah. I was coming up with um, some sort of schema to try to think about how to, you know, how we're going to, you know, allow for the vaulting mechanism to happen. It was just, my mind just wasn't really all in on ball. So I got to, uh, I had a re- actually I had a really good OTAs, and there was a lot of buzz about me maybe beating out Logan Woodside for the backup job. I got to training camp and I sucked. I stink. Uh, it was just bad. It was just, it was just. Uh, I remember the day the I, the throw that got me cut. We were sitting there, um, probably three weeks into training camp. We're sitting there throwing red zone passes, throwing your typical uh, you know red zone uh, post. So you're trying to aim at the t- the high yeah. upright. You know you know how that goes. Try to put the ball high. And, and then uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, but check this out. This is on air. <laughs> <laughs> this is a manager. This is, this is literally this is literally an equipment manager. Sticks who's uh, st- who standing in the end zone. He can't really jump high off the ground at all. So like he was actually one of the hardest guys to throw to because he's so tall, but has you know not very athletic, but has good yeah, hands. So you got to put it right yeah, on. Yeah, so you yeah. got to put it right yeah. on, right? 
and and uh, J Rob, our, our GM, is walking out, walking out of the, or down the back of the end zone. I throw he's he's kind of on like on the far corner. I throw the first one in the dirt. J Rob's still walking. All right, let me get it back. Let me get it back. Let me get it back. Come back. Throw the second one. Throw it like at his waist. He catches that one, but still supposed to be high. Yeah. J Rob's still walking. Go back again. Throw the third one. Sail it over sticks over J Rob. J Rob sees the ball. It bounces, hits the building, and he just keeps looking down and keeps walking. I was like, yeah. You got to cut, cut the next day? I got to cut the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I got to cut the next day. Yeah. All to a manager, dude. Yeah. It was, but yeah, the, the, the thing about you, again, knowing you now, like we met maybe eight months ago or something, is yeah. like your personality, and it's the reason that you're so successful at what you decided to do, is like you are either all in or you're all out. Yeah. Like, there's no way for you to, like, you know, if you're all in on one and none, like, you ain't thinking of anything else. Nothing else can bother you. Yeah. And that's the, that's the whole thing of, like, you know, I literally know for a fact that you were sitting in those core rec meetings, probably drawing up one of none and right, right through you. the meeting, <laughs> right through the agenda to talk to Pat about that next 100%, night. 100%. 100%. Literally checking off VCs. Have we talked to this one that yet? Or are we going to talk to that one? Uh, but, yeah, so training camp hits, and, and I, get, I get released, and – we're, it was before preseason games, and that that hurt. I'm like, dang, J-Rob, like, I can't even just get out and just play <laughs> one more time. I haven't played. Like, I didn't do preseason the year before because yeah. of COVID. Like, I haven't even got out there to put some good tape up. Like, you can't at least give me one preseason game? Let's me go. Matt Barkley gets signed. Damn, I was pissed. Yeah. Uh, but I had uh, I had a call back from the Raiders <laughs> to go back again to do preseason there. I'm out. <laughs> go to the Bears, go to Detroit, and I sat there and, and you know, Shelby and I, my girlfriend and I, had a, a long conversation about it. And, like, this is this is what I, I I can't stand about this business. I'm getting ready to go put two suitcases together. I'm getting ready to pack as if I'm going to be there the whole year. I could I could not even get signed after this workout, and I might be coming right back here. You don't know if you should be coming with me and planning for Detroit or Chicago or, or Raiders. Like, this, this is what's so tough about football. Like, I really love this concept. I really love the concept of being a businessman. I've never been more passionate about anything in my life. I can't even stop dreaming about this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this. And, you know, I had a, a, a very tough conversation with my agent. I had one of the hardest conversations ever with my mom, who still to this day knows that, that the, the, the Sean that she had should be still playing in the NFL and knows the ability that I have. And I know I still, you know, have the, have the, the, the you know, potential in me and the knowledge in me and the ability in me to still be playing. But, you know, for me, it goes back to the conversation we were having earlier. And that was like, you know, this football to me was always a means to a way. And I, for the first time ever, I see the way. Like, th this yeah. is it. One of none, one of none is what, what, I, what I'm going to be spending my time on. So I made a decision to hang them up right then and there and, and stop taking those calls, and it kept coming. You know, now you're in the season, and injuries start happening. So coming, are you throwing? Are you throwing? And uh, I the answer's no. Them off. Yeah, the answer's <laughs> no. Until the Titans called because they had a COVID situation. So I got signed back for one more game that season. Got signed on the day before Thanksgiving. I was on the airport with Shelby out to San Francisco to spend some time with her family, but um, ended up uh, uh, getting signed back to the Titans, stayed here, took a nice little trip to, to Boston. Mm -hmm. Played against the, the Patriots, had no worry in the world, knowing I was getting cut that next week. I was there from Thursday until Tuesday. Easy ten k. Oh, it was the <laughs> it was the it was the best weekend I've ever had with my relationship with football because yeah. I just didn't care. You're not gonna play. <laughs> no, like I'm I'm doing football. I, I'm doing one of none. Like we're, the be, the worst thing that happens is that they bring me back next week. <laughs> you know? like, that's the worst thing that could happen here. Yeah. So that, that, that was uh, so I got signed back for one more game, and then you know we got off to the races of, of you know trying to finish up the the concept around one of none, and you know raising our first round of financing, and you know hiring a team and, yeah. and getting rolling. So that I want to ask you a couple things: um, raising money that first time as a NFL quarterback, everyone knows you from your from your Notre Dame and NFL days, and now you're going to venture capitalists, and you're going to friends and family, and you're telling about this business, and they're like weren't you playing football like oh, yeah. this past year? Like, what do you mean you're starting a business? And, you know, there's that – there's a stigma of NFL players. They're not smart. They just play football. You know, like, what was that process like when you were convincing people to invest in the – in your what pre-seed round or yeah, whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a couple of things there. One is that, you know, from a friends and family side, 
anyone who was in my circle was like, yeah, about time. You yeah. know, like they, they, knew. They, 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 knew. Knew. Yeah. they knew. They knew. It was like yeah. there was no surprise. Like, yeah, everyone, you know, was, was rooting for me. And, and, you know, when you're when, – when you're playing at a high level, and you know this from playing in college at a high level, when you're playing at that high level, everyone around you's, at, at, you know, at that yeah. high level with you. you know, yeah. Your best friends are the coolest people in the bar because <laughs> they know you. You know, yeah. like you get down with the uh, with the game and you're facetiming them, and they yeah. they're all hyped up. So like everyone wanted me to have that great career, but they also knew that like this was always me. So like th- those people were cool. Now with the investors on the investor side, that was interesting because you know the first few investors didn't believe you could just tell that they didn't believe this was it. Like they didn't they, really You're just leaving football for this, yeah. you know, like what, why, why would you ever do that? Cause on their side of the fence, like that, their dream is to be an NFL quarterback. Why would you ever cut to, to be a, you know, or leave football to ever go start a business and, you know, continue to ride that out. So that was a little tough, but um, very quickly, you know, Pat and I, we, 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 we are yin and yang when it comes to, to, you know, starting up businesses. He, he understands the intricacies. He worked for something that was close to a startup in a way, um, and is you know one of the smartest guys I know, and compliments everything that I do really well. So he was he was really good at getting us prepped for what you know a true pitch should look and feel like from from you know finances to to storylines and things. And then you know me, I I was I've been in front of a camera from from 14 years old mm-hmm. through all the way through the NFL. So like when it comes to pitching, like. Pat's like, you know, Pat, Pat, he's a little bit different to me. Pat wants to, you know, think about it and know his lines and talk about it and practice it. And Pat's like, bro, like, we got to get ready for him. Yeah, like, look, you just man, show just, up. Yeah, yeah. Just let me, just let me rock, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out. Like, I, you know, we're on the fly. And it took me a couple of times before we got it right. And, and it's, we still are updating the pitch every day. But um, it was, it was once we started talking to those big VCs where I was like, yeah, this is, this is me. Cause like, I'm thinking to myself, these guys are the smartest guys in the world. They have all the money. They make all the money. They all were founders. They all have experience. And if I'm going in there and they're asking me their toughest questions and I'm coming out on the other side feeling positive and they're giving yeah. me great feedback and tell me, hey, you, you're this is a great idea. You're a little early. Call us back here soon. I'm like, all right, this must be something. And it, it got me you know, amped up the same way that you know I felt when – uh, I you know started playing or played against Deshaun Watson and started you know lost and th- mm-hmm. those losses playing against the big dogs make you know that you, you could do good, it you yeah. know some yeah. these these losses of getting you know said no to by Sequoia and and Andreessen was like all right at least they're they're listening yeah. you know yeah I feel like we need to get like Pat to like walk through we've been talking about the whole time you want to just like pop in here so people see see what see at least put it put like a face <laughs> to the name we'd sit down man yeah, yeah. the. Uh, yeah, just, just just say hi, you know. Like we we got an audio camera. You want to introduce yourself, man? Hello, everybody. Pat. <laughs> Coming in Pat cold Dalton. here. <laughs> yeah. oh, God. I feel like we've been talking about you yeah. for a while. So watch over the sidelines. A little, little different than just popping in here, going after. It. Yeah, no, I, I, I just I just wanted you to say hi to the camera, man. You know, say so people people want to face the name. Um, so I wanted to ask you about. The assembling the team and and we I don't think I've said this yet but we're gonna I'm gonna say in the intro I'm part of the one of none team we got like five people here who are part of the one of none team right now um, what was the, what was obviously it was you and Pat what did the assembling the team um, you know what, what did that process look like and when did you start kind of building it out and deciding who you obviously brought Tommy in who was your who's behind one of the cameras pretending to be a cameraman, but, you know, wears a lot of hats, you know, and, and he grew up with you. And what did that process go, look like? Yeah, so, so I think first I haven't I haven't even defined, and we haven't even said what One of None actually is. So yeah, I think, I think that, that, that'll show you. So One of None is this platform that, that helps creators. We work with artists. We work with brands. We work with, you know, you know trendsetters, musicians to create limited edition pieces. Uh, we really focus in on art because, you know, understanding how much of that's an asset and holds its value, and a lot of people understand that. But do some fashion and collectibles as well. We take every piece that we launch and we marry it in a one-to-one relationship with an NFT so that collectors have what we call hybrid ownership, which essentially means that you can either redeem the physical, um, you know, if it's a piece of art put on a wall, luxury good wear, or you can leave it vaulted with us. We take care of storage and insurance and keep the physical in good condition. And while it sits with us, you now have this NFT that acts as your right to redeem your physical at any point in time. So that if anyone comes to the secondary market and places a bid on the product, Rather than sending the physical in the StockX for authentication or getting an appraiser to come say that that painting is real, instead it's already in our vault. You can just pass on the ownership by simply passing on the NFT that represents it, all while being on every one of those resale transactions, you get that 5% royalty that's right in the NFT that goes back to the original creator. 
And so there's a lot of moving parts there. Whole lot. You know, this is a big idea. Very, very, very big idea. And that's the reason why I'm doing it. If it was a small idea, I would have continued to play football and tried a small idea on the side. This is something that can be uh, very large. And I think that it can be very powerful and will be very powerful. What, we got to talk about NFT NYC. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, just the amazing event that we put together in, I mean, it wasn't a short amount of time, but it all came together super fast and through like the party of the year in New York City and uh, just just go talk about that whole, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah. a, it was just a banger, <laughs> the yeah. whole party and it was a whirlwind and was kind of like the coming out party for one of none and put everything on the map as far as, you know, everyone in Web3 now, is no, now has heard of one of none. Yep. And I feel like that was kind of the momentum shift that, that kind of took everything to the next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we... Um we get to we get to January of this past year, and and we are trying to get things rolling. Pat is sick and tired of me coming in with a new idea and us pushing things back and pushing things back and pushing things back and pushing. Things DK back. loves ideas, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no shortage of ideas. So so Pat was like, "Look, we have to launch." Like we got, we, we, we're considering dropping an NFT and starting with an NFT project, screw the VCs, the decentralized everything. We're just going to go raise a bunch of money with an NFT. And then it was like, we started looking at NFTs and was like, yeah, that's, you know, we're not ready to run a community. You don't like Discord. I don't like project. Discord. Yeah. We're not an NFT project. This is by nature, this is a centralized vault. So we might as well, you know, stop trying to pretend like we're one of those decentralized companies and continue to do things in, in more of the web two space and bridge in that way. Um, so, so ultimately Pat was like, look, we have to launch, we got to put something in front of us. And I was like, well, we got NFT NYC coming up. You know, this was like at the time, February. And we we're like, yo, if we just put that in front of us and say, we're going to launch then that, that then hopefully we'll get everything done. That'll, that'll make sure that Mike knows where some deadlines are on tech. We got to stop taking some of these ideas. We'll get rolling. We're going to throw this dope hybrid gallery. I, I kept thinking to myself, we, we, we with physical products, we have this uncanny ability of actually being able to show up in physical spaces and really show off who we are to a physical collector, which in the digital world, obviously everything's done on Discord and through Twitter spaces and clubhouses and Zooms and things that are typically digital. We could really like you know define who we are in the space by having a really dope physical event that has the physical art and physical limited editions there alongside the digitals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we started putting, putting together this idea for a hybrid gallery and that was exactly what it was. Every piece that we're going to put on display is going to have a digital screen next to it that shows what the NFT looks like. We can educate the, the bridge between the two and ultimately allow if collectors uh, want to buy early an opportunity to buy those, those first NFTs, they can go up, scan the QR code, buy the NFT and then uh, redeem the product later. Um, I don't know a lot about galleries, but like. Figured it out. I know. I know Damn. how to. I know how to. Get, I know how to have a good time. So yeah. like, I, I don't. I don't know necessarily you know, that that every art piece has to be at eye level. So <laughs> you look back at these videos, you see this art all over the place, up in the rafters and shit. But we're gonna have a great time. Call my boy Jonah from Miami, and this guy is. I think he is is today's Basquiat. He, yeah. he is as as good as it gets. He's, he's the he's the piece behind us. And Jonah is a he's a he's a creative. And right then. It was like it was like it was meshing. Jonah's excited about it. He likes he likes New York. He has you know a spot to stay right down the street. Like he was he was all in for it. But Jonah was like, "Look, I'm not coming to do something normal. I got to do something special." Mm-hmm. So I was like, "All right, let's come up with an idea. What, what can we do here? Live performance." <laughs> so I was like, "All right, let's get a, let's get a street permit. You, know, you want to do yeah. something dope? Let's go in the streets of, of of New York. I don't know anything about New York City. I'm not from New York, but like I feel like I can get a street permit and have some fun." So. Um, that was like eight days before the event. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you don't got to remind me. <laughs> yeah. So within eight Tell days. Tell the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> so within eight days, this idea that we are going to build a wall in the middle of a street in New York, we're going to get a street permit. Somehow eight days before the event, we're going to convince someone to give us a street permit. And we are going to have like a street fest just as much as we're having this hybrid gallery inside. But within that piece... We're going to break it down into 16 individual sections mm-hmm. and display those back inside of the event, inside the venue, to have an NFT that represents each of those 16 pieces. So as he's painting live outside, people inside could see an overlay of, like, what piece they might be able to buy. Uh, we start, so we, you know, now we got to figure out how to build a wall. Yeah. So now I call my brother. 
hey, Derek, my brother's a contractor, works on homes. I don't know how to build this wall. How would you build the wall? Derek was like, I would build it like this. I was like, well, would you build it for me? Dope. Derek gets tapped five days before. He gets an Airbnb out in Brooklyn and starts to build this wall, shows up, sets it down. I cannot believe we have the wall built, but now all of a sudden we got to figure out how to project it inside. Mm -hmm. Inter Philly, Philly boys. Enter in the Philly <laughs> boys. We call yeah, you up. Hey, yeah. you do a lot of content, AB. You got anybody who knows yeah. how to do projector? Well, I got some friends back home. I don't know if they know how to do this, but they'll figure it out. So we literally, 48 hours before, tap the, tap it, tap uh, Stevie and Chris. Tell them to hop on a, on a train. Yeah. They drive in on a train. We go to B&H. We buy the best projector we can, yeah. set it up. <laughs> and literally within like 40 minutes before the event, we somehow yeah, get but, this projector to work. It, it wasn't oh. just B&H buying the thing. It was, remember the cords weren't working? Remember the you're morning right, of it, cords right, weren't you're working? Right, you're right. We, were, we were going through New York City we were trying you're to find cords. You were sprinting to Best Buy. Dude, and I <laughs> haven't run in four years. <laughs> and DK had me sprinting through, through freaking... What district? What, what part of New York City? Soho. Soho. Yeah, yeah. I was sprinting through Soho. I was running. There were some beautiful girls staring at me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, what's up with this psychopath? I was in freaking nice clothes. Yeah, that was a, that was a fun time. But if you showed Party up, popped off. Yeah, but if you showed up to that event, no matter how crazy it was to get up to that moment, I mean, it ended up being dope. We had, you know, two different or two different DJs. We had our boy Ollie. Um, who came and performed for us. Obviously, Let, Jonah yeah. was outside. Jonah decided he was going to make it a full festival, so he made some calls. He had a, he had a fresh fry going on outside. He had the local kids It was a coming. block party. It was a block yeah, party. Yeah, it was a true yeah. block party. And then Jonah got up on, on, on that wall, and he did what he did best, and he blew everyone's minds. Yeah. You know, he started he started with nothing but this freaking spray set of spray yeah. cans and these markers and ended up you know, doing the, sh the shading on the angel and all this dope stuff. Yeah. So it ended up being a, an unbelievable success for us. We sent it back, chopped it up, put it up on the wall here, and now we're getting ready to, to, yeah. to let that thing go. It'll and be for sale soon, right? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of yeah. none.io. <laughs> you got it, one of none.io. Uh, yeah. We Again, there's like so many things we could talk about. We will do another podcast talking more about one of none, but sure. we're so, a couple more things. Um, what would you say is – kind of like what you're looking forward to most for the business right now? I'm really looking forward to launching our next product, which is this uh, creator dashboard that will allow for um, all the artists that we've been talking to, as well as um, a lot of the new people that we're getting ready to reach out to that you've been spending time on the phone with. It gives them a space for them to um, network with each other, collab on new deals, um, takes all of the relationships and partnerships we've been able to build from 3D um, uh, animators to RFID chips to um, uh, vaulting solutions to TikTok help. All these solutions we've been able to bring to these artists now can onboard onto this dashboard, and now these creators have this space to network with each other, collab, um, uh, work with some of these creatives that we've been able to work with or bring, bring to the table you know, do all their contracts, do all their payments right there on that platform, but then ultimately launch these hybrid products on our platform and be able to track them. Um, I think that that, that product is going to be very, very uh, uh, special for the Web3 space because I think it's going to take a lot of Web2 creators that have had thoughts or questions about the space and how to get in, and now it gives them a safe environment around other creators who are just like them to learn about it, but ultimately is a, a full suite of tools from from inception all the way through the secondary exchange, that allows them to launch that product, uh, uh, you know, build that NFT off of it, and then uh, and then be able to track the, the both the collector as well as the product on chain and on our site in the secondary market and bring them information that they've never had in the resale market of that total lifetime value. Yeah, of their good. Where will one of them be in five years? One of none will have a vault of the world's most collectible products and we will pop up in places that you have never thought and in ways that you've never seen. I think that one of none will exist to help all of these creators from the local people here in Nashville that we're working with all the way to the top brands that, that we're in discussions with. We will purely exist to blow their mind with innovative technology. We'll be at the forefront of everything we do from AR, the metaverse, uh, VR, um, NFC tags, uh, uh, you know, hybrid experiences um, using you know, holograms and, and uh, taking physical spaces and trying to you know, blur that line between that and the metaverse. Um, I think that you know, wherever you're at listening to this, um, 
one of none will be in your, if you're in a major market, we'll be there in some capacity through a pop-up shop for a week, a month, maybe a permanent location. But we want to be continue to have these places show up um, for our, for the creators who are local to be able to, you know, learn about Web3 in, in a physical space. Uh, I think that uh, I'm really excited. Um, the metaverse is here. Uh, that, that's, that, that, is one, that is one thing that we've learned quite a bit over the last couple uh, months here that, that the metaverse is here. It's not, it's not what you guys think it is. It's not ready player one. It is on your phone. It is, it is in your browser. It is using items that you're used to and it's going to slowly creep into your life, whether you like it or not. And, uh, the, the benefits of that metaverse is that decentralized nature of blockchain that powers it. And we're going to be that bridge that brings all the physical collectors and all those physical products into that metaverse. I love it. I love it. Few rapid fire questions to end. You ready? Yeah. This has been a long hey, one. This we, has been a long one. Yeah. I don't know what we're at right now, but we're, it's it's long. But we got to end with, with a couple rapid fire. What's, what's the longest podcast you've ever listened this, to? This is it. Oh, listen to? Yeah. Have you ever? Oh, I listened to like a three, four hour one with Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah. Four hours. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, we're not yeah, at four yeah, yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. You, you be Joe, I'll be Elon. We can, we can, we can yeah, compare exactly. it to that. All right, deal. deal. I, don't, I don't feel as crazy. It's 10.06 yeah, yeah. right now. Um, someone, someone call Shelby and let her know. I'm <laughs> yeah, your girlfriend's like, yeah, where's the shot? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, here we go. We'll I be promise quick. it was three hours. We'll be good. We'll be quick. <laughs> Favorite moment of your career? Easy. Virginia. Uh, game winning touchdown. Fan falls over the side of the wall. Special moment for Notre Dame fans. Special moment for me. Special moment for Will. That was amazing. Toughest moment of your career? Senior year against Clyde High School. My mom's alma mater. Small town. Way outside of Toledo. We were shooing to win the state championship again. And those guys came out and threw the rock on us. And I ended up fumbling on the three-yard line to win the game. And that one, that one still hurts. I end, I ended my eighth grade career and my high school career with the same fumble at the same, uh, at the same point or part of the field. Try to spin, move, and jump in the end zone. Ball gets knocked out. That one hurt. Oh, you can't reach it out, man. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> reach out. can't reach it out. Learn the hard way. Top three NFL quarterbacks. Right now. Yeah. It's weird. Right now, it's a weird time. Josh Allen. Aaron Rodgers, Pat Mahomes. Top three environments you've played in? Clemson. I was just a redshirt freshman, but Florida State was lit. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. It was lit. They were coming off. Tallahassee. Yeah, that was, was lit. <laughs> um, was that Jameis? Yeah. Yeah. University of Notre Dame, God Country. That's number one. That's a special place. That does, I mean, I mean, count. What do you mean? All right, okay. you say, wait, uh, <laughs> you're right. I didn't say. Away, I didn't away, say on the road. I didn't say yeah, on the road. If you go on the road, then I, I'll, I'll I'll finish up with uh, Texas UT yeah. Sunday Night Football. That was 110,000. So that's a lot of stadium. Was that, yeah, was yeah. Really? Yeah. That was nice. Top three favorite entrepreneurs: Vitalik, who is the 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 founder of uh, Ethereum. Mm-hmm. He's truly changing the world forever. I mean. Giving, giving ownership back to the, the user and allowing us to build these dApps on top of the blockchain is something that's more powerful than the internet itself, I think. It's special. Um, Phil Knight. Mm. Every step of the way, give ownership and equity to those people. Don't try to force them in your space. Build them a freaking building. Serena, LeBron, MJ, Michael Phelps, they all have buildings on that campus, you know. So that the the way that you go about building that that brand into what it is comes from saying, yeah, call it a Jordan. Yeah, don't force it to be a Nike. Call it a Jordan. Call yeah. it a LeBron. I call it a KD. That's a, that's a special brand. Dream brands to work with at one of none. Top three. Uh, Patek Philippe, Ferrari. Gosh, Ferrari, this would be incredible. I promise you, this would be incredible. Just take take your one in five, take your one in ten, take your one in a hundred. Let it come with an NFT. People won't even redeem it. You'll make money on all, every resale transaction. You'll get more data than you've ever had on your cars. Go to your your top list. It makes a lot of sense, Ferrari. It makes more sense than uh, last is uh, Teenage Engineer. Dope, dope, dope synthesizer company. Love the vibe. Love their brand. Big fan of everything they do. 
by nature, everything they launch is a limited edition. It's affordable. It's a collectible. If you're into music and you understand synthesizers, this is like, you know, it's, it's just such a fun brand. I would love to just do something one of done with them. We were watching earlier today. We put up my podcast with Jared Goff, and I said, and I asked him a question. I said, that's, that's really corny. I'm not going to ask you that, but I am going to ask you it anyway because I think with your story, it's important. What is your why? What's the reason that, you know, you grind all day, every day? What's the reason that you gave up football to do this now? What's the reason that even when you were playing football that you were, you know, you talked about your time with the Browns and you were there all day, every day, 6, 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. What, what's your why? It's, uh, it's a, bit, a bit stereotypical and, and a bit cliche, but I, I truly believe that I exist to be a bridge to people who think that there's these gaps between who they are and the people who might be doing things at a higher level. By that, I mean, you know, I'm biracial. I I was, I mean, Drake Drake said it best. You know, I, I was not, I'm, I was never black enough to be with the black guys. And I definitely wasn't white and I wasn't at the country club with the white guys. So I just learned how to, do both. I learned how to be a chameleon. I learned how to, how to, how to, you know, hang out in my hood and, and, and be respected there and, and, you know, be in those neighborhoods and play with those guys on, on the court. But then I also learned how to talk and carry myself and, and, and act like my friends from my, from my, you know, Catholic high school who grew up at the country club. Cause I knew that that's where I wanted to be in life. I, I knew I wanted to get out of West Toledo. I knew my dad did way too much, uh, and worked way too hard for, me not to be successful. Um, so I, I think that, you know, my life is, is a representation of trying to bridge West Toledo to, you know, Stone Oak Country Club, which was, that was my dream. You know, yeah. I wanted to go be able to go get myself a Stone Oak burger and put it on my own number, <laughs> which, you know, which is really small scale compared to what, what you know, what yeah. we're thinking now, but like that, I knew that I could do both. And, and, I think that now I my my mission my why is is that if I can go figure this thing out in the business world it takes all of the things that I've been told that I couldn't do all the things I've been told I'm dumb for doing you know you're dumb for for just playing ball and not you know not being a good uh uh you know um, academic when I was in grade school then all of a sudden it was you're dumb for leaving school early and going to the NFL, in which all I'm trying to do is, is is change my family's life, and then all of a sudden you're dumb for leaving the NFL and starting a business. I think that this business, when that whatever that success metric is, whenever that hits, that will be my opportunity now to go straight back through the NFL, through Notre Dame, right down 80-90 into Toledo, through my Catholic high school and all the way back to West Toledo and tell everybody along the way that you making fun of those people in the country club, are you at the country club making fun of those people in West Toledo? You're both idiots. All you had to do is just learn what they're doing on that side and learn what they're doing on the other side. It is okay to be professional. It's okay to sound like a businessman. It's okay to be proper if you're in the hood. It's okay to be swaggy. It's okay to not button up your shirt all the way. It's okay to not wear pastels if you're in the country club. It is okay to be completely you and go after whatever you want. Because everyone can be successful. That's the American dream, you know. And I and I think that for me to to finally get that out of this business will finally be my opportunity to go back and finally chat with my my you know the the inner city football league, my high school, and everyone else, and just let them know that like, look, this is it is okay to be you. It's okay to take your own path. You do not have to be what everyone else wants you to be. I'm already running through a brick wall. Let's fucking go. I'm fired Let's up. Let's get it. That was amazing. Let's get it. Well. Um, I appreciate your time. This was like three hours long. So this was, I, I it, it's tough to get you to sit down to do anything for like 15 minutes. So for three hours was <laughs> impressive. Um, I, I appreciate you and how transparent and open you were during this. I think it'll be really cool for fans of yours for a long time that haven't heard you talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot about your career for, uh, and then for people to hear what you're doing now, people that haven't followed you since you stopped playing. I think it's, I think it's inspirational, not just, 
number one for like entrepreneurs and people starting businesses, but also for athletes who yep. have other passions and are kind of shunned away from doing that kind of stuff. I think it'll be awesome. Um, your story is amazing. You're a great leader. I love being working with you and being part of your team. And uh, I'm just glad we got to do this finally. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this to come out and for people to hear it. And I think it's going to be really positively received. And obviously you're a great communicator. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people are going to love it. Appreciate it, man. This is great. Yeah. I appreciate you getting me here, and and I think we should do a lot more of this. Yeah, I don't know, we'll I don't know we'll, do, we'll like. do some more we stuff. Should, we should yeah. do some more stuff. Yeah, because yeah. I, I I had about sixty more questions written down, but when we hit hour three, I figured we'd probably have to cut this <laughs> thing right. off. Right. I appreciate right. it, man. All right, and this was DK shows. <laughs> <laughs> good ending. Well, uh, good work, Krill. Well,